Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder. I told you, I told you I'd be back with a book, and here we are. The highly requested Six of Crows. We are diving into the Grisha verse. This has often been compared to like the YA Game of Thrones energy. The world building is intense. There's a lot of fights, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of people that want to kill each other. And I can see that, which is a really high compliment because I mean Game of Thrones, mine the last installment of the TV series, incredible, unparalleled, at least in the exposure that Game of Thrones had, and I can see why it's being compared. Like I really, I am in thick in my fantasy era right now. Your book has a court, a fairy court, some sort of high court of da 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 da, or in the case of Six of Crows, an ice court. I want to take the journey. I want to see some weird characters. I want to fork a fairy. Like that's the era that I'm living in right now. <laughs> So anyway, let's talk about Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. I was debating on whether I wanted to start with Six of Crows first or the Shadow and Bone series because I wanted to read at least one of the series before trying to dive into the Netflix series, which I believe is about to release season two. The reason being, even though they take place in different timelines, I believe the Netflix show is said to have expertly weaved them together to make them both play at the same time somehow. Oh, so the, yes. the show is about it's mainly focusing on Shadow and Bone, Alina Starkov, if I'm not mistaken, but there is a Six of Crows in there. Mm. And that's what we're talking about. It's said to be an incredible watch, but if I if you go on Reddit, everyone says, you know what, I tried to watch it before reading the book, and it was okay. And then they were like, then I read the book and I watched it. It was like the best show I've ever seen in my whole entire fing life. I die for this. And we tried watching episode one. We didn't fall in love. So I attempted mm. the book, right? So good. Okay, so good. I don't know why I chose Six of Crows, but I'm so glad that I did. There's another book to this one right after. It's a duology. I'm not doing a bam on that one, so please read along with me. Here's the thing about Six of Crows. Don't get me wrong, I love romance. And the way that I would compare it to Akatar, because people like these comparisons, Akatar is heavy on romance, right? Like, sh is going down. People are about to die. And in the end, it's like love. In the moment of like high tension, they're like, wait, hold on. They do a little kissy kiss, okay? This book, this book is like, hey, we really like each other and there's that romantic tension, but um, you're about to die right now, so I'm gonna try to save you. It's more focused on the action, <laughs> if that makes sense. There's okay. not like these tense moments where the characters are facing their inevitable death and they're like, let me take my last two seconds of breathing oxygen to tell you I've always been into you. So which one you like more, come on. Honestly, honestly, honestly. Honestly. Like, in terms of what? <laughs> what? What do you mean? It's different. I feel, okay, I wouldn't say this is literature. Don't come for me. But this is more like Hunger Games, Game of Thrones. There's romance. There's fantasy. Why you talk like that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is my, like this is when you ask me to sh on someone, I get really nervous. But then Akatar, Akatar is definitely heavy romance. Like, it's a little smutty. And I heard it gets even smuttier and smuttier and smuttier. Which is just, you know, different. It's not worse or better. In fact, it might be better. <laughs> so yes, I'm gonna leave all of the links for Lee Bardugo's books in the description, but we're gonna be baking some lemon cakes because I don't know, it's spring season, we're doing lemons. But I need to give you some background. I will say going into Six of Crows, I was freaking confused. Like the first two chapters, I'm like, where am I? I don't understand a single thing that this person is saying right now. And it wasn't, I think in the end it paid off, but in the first two chapters I was getting very frustrated. So I wish I had Googled it first. This is what I have gathered about the Grishaverse, and I'm not a Grisha expert, so bear with me. Grishaverse is this huge, like think Westeros of Game of Thrones. There's multiple countries and cities and different types of people that are occupying this massive world and they all kind of hate each other. There's allies, there's wars, there's this um, shadow fold where you basically just go missing inside and there's monsters that come out to kill you. But the shadow and bone, as well as the Six of Crows duology, they're all in the Grishaverse. And inside the Grishaverse, like I said, tons of countries. There is a whole ass war between people. What is people. Grisha? Grisha, good thing you asked. Grisha is a type of person. They're not immortal, so they're not like fairies, but they have some sort of magical powers. They're called small sciences, but it's basically magic, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the war does not really concern us right now in this book, but the ranks of Grisha does. So 
like I said, they use small science, aka magic, to manipulate things and people around them. A lot of them are trained for the second army for the country of Ravka, but basically there's three orders of Grisha. The first are the Ethereaki, okay? They can manipulate or summon natural elements. So there's three types in that order, and one can summon wind, fire, water, and it's not like you can typically do all three. Typically you specialize in just one. Mm -hmm. So tide makers are known to control water, manipulate water. Squallers, they manipulate wind. But this is not one of those, um, it's not one of those books where the magic has no limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're not gonna yeah. be able to create a tsunami and just kill people. Yeah, they can like, like that. Yeah, yeah, basically, <laughs> like wind. Ooh, it's breezy. Ooh, it's stinky. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Okay, and then Inferni, they manipulate fire, right? Then the second order, you have the Materialki, and they can maneuver materials. So they have durists who handle solids, alchemy, who handle chemicals, and then I believe the fabricators are in there. Mm -hmm. And they can like pull, they can pull, let's say you have um, a giant bucket of elements. They can try to pull iron out of it. If there's mm. iron in that mix, they can just mm. kind of like move it around, take mm. it out. And then the highest rank of the Grisha, they're called like the corporalki. They can control the human body. So that's the heart renders can manipulate your internal organs. So they can make your heart pump faster. They can make your uh, blood slow down, which means they can kill you in the sweep of their hands because they can essentially make you stop breathing. They can shut down your internal organs. Are they like really rare? They're very, yes. They're very mm. hard to come by and again, the, the levels of power are different. Mm. I mean, there's like one or two, I believe, in the Grisha verse that are just chosen ones. Like the, the Alina from Shadow and Bone, she's like a chosen one. She can summon the sun or something like that. Mm. But in Six of Crows, they're all just like regular, regular people, okay? Mm. They have like a little bit of power. Yeah, they're like yeah. powerful, but not really powerful. You like know they have I mean? to get creative with their yeah, power. Yeah, yeah, they're like, their that is above my pay grade. Mm. That's the type of feeling. Then you have healers who can heal. And then you have tailorers who specialize in just changing your physical appearance. Like in the sweep of their hand, they can change your eye color, your hair color, your face mm. structure and everything. Mm -hmm. And most of them are trained at a place called the Little Palace. This is like Grisha University. But other than Alina, who is the protagonist of Shadow and Bone, like I said, most Grishas are not powerful enough to end wars. Like their powers are there, yes. It's scary for people who have no powers, but they're not like fairies with ultimate power over mortals type of feeling. Like you know how in Akatar, the fairies and the humankind, I mean, it's not even a game. This it's like kind of a game mm. like there are human armies that literally go after Grisha just to kill them because mm. all they have to do is get a rope and wrap their hands together because Grisha summon powers with their hands mm. and if they can't use their hands they're basically a human and they're mortal unlike fairies mm. unlike most fairies yeah Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. So they're not gods. They can't do everything and anything. There's limits to their magic. There's limits to their mortal bodies. They can only push themselves so much. That is, until a very, very precarious little substance was created. Consider it the Adderall of the Grisha, but better, okay? It's a powder that could turn them into being a Grisha that even the gods would have shivered under. It's what makes it so euphoric to the Grisha taking it. And it's also what signs the taker's death warrant. Because feeling like Wait, a god- what's the taker? The, the Grisha, whoever takes this oh. drug, this new substance that hit the market, they're gonna die. It's like a death sentence. Because feeling like a god is addicting, but your body cannot keep up with this. Mm. Now we're gonna talk about Ketterdam. This is where everything takes place. Um, there's not a lot of Grisha here. Ketterdam is typically run by mortals, very rich, rich humans. They're called the Merchants' Council. And merchants sounds like they're traders, right? And they are, they do lots of shipping. Consider them like the Jeff Bezos of today, the Warren Buffett of today. They control Ketterdam. But there's a part of Ketterdam that's called the barrel. And it's like the bottom of the barrel. Like this is, this is the slums of Ketterdam, basically. The people that live there, they're thieves, there's a lot of gang activity, they're barely getting by, they're literally dying in Ketterdam. And it's just known as this massive trade center. Mm -hmm. That's what Ketterdam is. And Mr. Hode, he's a huge merchant there. Councilman Hode is probably as, as high as it gets in the ranks, and it's expected. Wait, what's Councilman Hode? That's his name. Hode oh. is his last name, and he's a councilman in Cal Ketterdam. Oh, okay. Councilman so is a... Just a name, would you call someone? Yeah, he's um, the councilman. They're called the Council of Merchants, okay? 
That's what they're called. And they run Ketterdam.、Mm. They're just humans. They're just really, really, really rich, non magical humans.、Mm. And it's expected that because he's so rich, even though he's human, he would have a Grisha indentured servant.、Mm. Or、Got、three,、it. or five, right? Who really he's knows? He's just a businessman. Yes, but、mm. he can buy Grisha and force them to work for him. Yeah. And who really knows how many Grisha he has? I mean, who's really counting? Besides, Hode likes to think that he wasn't holding them hostage.、Mm. He would give them this little workshop in the back of his mansion, and they never really tried to run away. I mean, the constant guards pointing loaded rifles at the Grishas, like for all hours of the day, probably was a big deterrent. But come on, Hode's a nice guy, you know what I mean? Perhaps the disappearance of the Grisha servants was just a coincidence. The Grisha servants in Hode's house was disappearing. One by one. That is precisely what Juiced, Hode's newest guard, told himself. Juiced is working as a guard at Hode's house, and he's thinking, you know what? One Grisha disappeared. That's not all of them. He might have gotten the flu or something.、And、he's like, my boss, Councilman Hode. He seems like a nice guy that likes to give nice big promotions to guys like me. He tries to think these little happy, naive thoughts when he's summoned to the Hode boathouse. He enters the little separate building and he comes across this room filled with guards. All of the guards that work on this property are inside the boathouse right now. And inside the entire living room, he's staring directly into a giant cage. It takes up most of the room. It's less of a cage, but more of a box room. There's walls set up and windows where you can look in. But a guard informs Juiced that from the inside out, you can't see out because it's mirrored. Interesting. The box caged was well made, reinforced steel, big enough to fit a table inside, along with a girl who was sitting there and a guard behind her, just eyes trained on her like she could pounce any second. But Juiced knew that she would never pounce. The girl's name is Anya, and she's a healer. I mean, Juice knew better than to ask Hode what's going on because this is very weird. Instead, he fell back with all the other guards that looked like they were waiting for something to happen, and he asked, "What the hell is going on?" Beats me, but better than standing guard in the garden all day, no?、Uh, I guess. But why are we brought in here? I don't know. Just shh, keep quiet. So they watch as Hode brought in a young little boy into the cage, and、um, Hode grabs Anya's chin. Do as you're told, and everything will be over soon. Hode whispers something to the guard in the cage before stepping out, and you hear the clanking of multiple heavy locks set into place. And one of Hode's advisors asks him loudly in front of all the guards, "Do you think this is a smart idea?" Well, why wouldn't it be? But you know what happened to the other, your other? Just this one's different. This is Anya. She's a healer. They're not prone to aggression, and neither is she. But you're not going to give her nearly the same dose, right, Councilman Hode? Of course not. Hode nodded, and there was a series of guards that let the inside guard know that it was time. The inside guard whips out a long knife, grabs the little boy's arm, who's crying, and says, "This might hurt, just a little," and slashes his arm. The little boy is hysterical, and Anya leans down with tears pooling in her eyes. She grabs the little boy's arms and tries to calm him down. This is only going to tickle a tiny bit, and she starts healing him. It was fascinating to most of the guards. They had never seen a Grisha healer at work. I mean, she's actually at work. It's almost like the skin was slowly closing back together and meshing together, like melted, shredded cheese on a on a pan, <laughs> like just uniting slowly. Hode nodded once more, and this time Anya was given a little packet of powder. She was forced to take it. She asked to no one in particular,、uh, "What is it?" Hode can hear her. Everyone can. And Hode says, "None of your concern. It's not going to kill you. Just take it and do what you're told. We just want to evaluate how you perform and see how、um, the drugs' effects are, how strong they are." It doesn't seem like Anya really has a chance, you know. She doesn't have leeway to argue. She takes the powder, and the guards in the room they see her pupils dilate in an instant. It's like a fast-acting drug. I mean, it seems nearly impossible, no, to work that fast. Anya's entire body seems to loosen up. Just loose, and she seems like she's floating, but also kind of vibrating. Like there's so much going on inside of her, and there was something very drastic about her demeanor. Before she was concerned, she was worried, she was subservient, she was bowing down to Hode, she was trying to fix this boy's arm, and now, now she was, she was cocky, she was confident, like the gods. 
or a man who just doesn't know better, you know what I mean? So Hode instructs her to heal the boy and without even looking at the boy, without even touching the boy, because like I said, Grisha have to use their hands to do their magic. She waves her hand in the air, almost like she's swatting a fly away and is cut instantly heals. She didn't even have to touch the boy. Hode is getting excited in his chair. He tells Anya to try a few more tests, okay? We're gonna give you a couple more things. Cut off the boy's thumb, he screams. The guards are staring at each other and the inside guard is about to pull out his knife when Anya speaks to him without even looking at him. Shoot the glass down. You heard me. Do it. The guard's eyes looked dazed, like very unfocused. He puts his knife back, grabs his rifle, aims at all the windows, shoots it down. Pure chaos. The guards are screaming, get her, and Hode is screaming at the other guards, do you guys know how much I paid for this one? Do not shoot, keep her alive. Anya smiles and raises both hands, like a little politician, okay? Wait, all the guards freeze. Juice said, it finally felt like he was at peace, calm, as if nothing in the world could be more joy provoking than waiting. Just standing here waiting, frozen, that's like his pursuit of happiness right now. And then she spoke again. Hode, come in here. Juice watched calmly, happily, as he watches his boss walk into the cage. And she says, do as you're told, and it'll soon be over, yeah? Exactly what he told her. Now pick up the knife, Hode. That is the beginning chapter of this book. Okay, in the beginning, this felt rather random since I was confused. I wasn't familiar with the Grisha verse or Grisha or healers or any of these terms and phrases. But once I kept reading, oh, it's so good. These aren't even our main cast of characters today. These aren't even our little thieves. Wait, wait, wait. So from what I gather, yes. once she take that pill, she almost become like a goddess. She has infinite power. And it's not just um, it's sequestered not... to her healing powers. Right. Yes. She has like the healing power almost expanded to other levels. Basically, um, we're going to talk about the drug in depth later, but because she's a healer, she deals with inner bodies. She can heal your mind, basically. She can almost control your mind. Yes. With the other rankings, they can't control your mind, but they can just do insane things. Like they could create a tsunami, basically, now, mm, if they yeah. take this drug. But in a way, this is more powerful. Yes. Controlling humans, controlling yes. your mind. So even without this drug, they are the highest level of Grisha. This order is the most powerful. Healers, heart renders, the people that can oh, control the human the body. Oh, the and... Yeah, the elements, the material manipulation, they're the lower ranks. Mm. And then the physical body people are the highest mm. ranks. Wow. It's fascinating, right? Yeah. Yeah, and healers are known to not be aggressive. Heart renders are actually the aggressive counterpart to healers. Mm. They can heal, it's just very foreign to them. Mm. They're usually better at like knocking you down unconscious. Mm. So now they're like, hey, can you heal me? You're like, um, I don't really know how to do that. But well. you're going to talk about like what happens to these people, oh, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> is it wow. good? It's kind of good. I knew it was good because he was so excited. He brought his little bag of nuts down. He was like, I'm so ready for this story. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wait, should we start baking a little yes. bit? We'll be back with the mixing. We're just going to make some soft butter and some sugar. That's it. Sugar butter. I might have oversimplified this recipe. There is actually a melted butter, sugar, juice of one lemon, and three eggs whisked together. And now we're gonna fold in some flour and salt. This is gonna be the base of our lemon cakes, the actual cake part. Now listen, let's get to our crows, the six of crows. So there's gonna be six of them, and they're basically part of one of the bigger gangs in Ketterdam called the Dregs, okay? Wait, 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 slow down. There are six crows? They call themselves the Crows. Uh-huh, so six members yes. to a gang. But we're not gonna go through all six of them yet because right. some join at later times. But the Dregs is a huge game. We're just talking about some of the key members that are gonna be in this story. Um, think gambling house, uh, port stalking, racketeering type, like those types of gangs, like back in the day. But wearing fancy suede long coat and fancy hat. Yeah, they look super cool. It's giving like Peaky Blinders, but even older. Very classy, but they'll stab you for funsies. Mm. Yeah, very <laughs> So Kaz Brecker is the first person. He's like the main character of this. Kaz? Kaz, K-A-Z. Does he have power? No. Oh, yeah. So these are all regular people. Um, yeah, but maybe they're not like regular, regular. Yeah, okay. They're talented. Yes. Kaz is not the leader of the dregs game. He's almost like the, like the de facto leader but not the official leader. Everyone mm. in the drags respects him quite a bit. Not because they like the guy so much, because 
but because they're terrified of him. His nickname was Dirty Hands, and he wore these black leather gloves everywhere he went, literally never takes them off. Not a single soul has ever seen him without his gloves on, and there's rumors about why. Some say he wore those gloves because he killed so many people that his hands were literally stained in blood. Others said it was because his hands were shredded up by a rival that he had killed. More imaginative gossipers claimed that he had monster toes as fingers and claws because he's a f demon. He's a little claw daddy. Crawfish claw. Like, that's what I'm thinking in my head. The truth is probably scarier, but we're gonna get to that a little bit later. And side note about the gang. Kaz works for Per Haskell. Per Haskell is the old man that runs the dregs. He is the official leader of the dregs. Just think old Ajashi, okay? That's the vibe. But don't let the age fool you. He'll kill you. But at least he lets Kaz get away with a lot more than the other gang members. Another thing to note about Kaz is that when he walks, he has this very scary looking cane that he uses. And it's got this giant crow on top. It's the symbol of the dregs. He also sported a crow tattoo, just like all the other dregs members, it's mandatory. And I think it just really adds to the allure of like, what happened to this guy? Why does he never take off his gloves? Why does he have this cane? Like, what has he done to even get to this point? He also has the stereotypical YA main character, raspy deep voice, meanwhile still being like, I don't know, 17 years old or something. 17 years old? Why? I think he's like 18 or something. Yeah, I know. He's 18 years old? Okay, so here's what I do. In books like this, when they keep telling me their age and they're like 18, I'm like, I didn't read that. I didn't read that. Exit that out. This is a fictional book, so I can act like that didn't exist. Mm. So I didn't want to even tell you guys the ages, but... um. But usually it's like a young, fit dude. Yes, but I'm imagining like a 30-year-old that but seems I know what you mean. at least. Yeah, when I was used to these like Chinese fiction no book too, it's always like ever since they were seven, they're trained in some crazy yeah. thing. And then by the time they're 14, they're already at the top of the world. <laughs> yeah, but then I'm like, um, guys, I'm almost 30 years old and I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm making... <laughs> lemon bars in front of a camera <laughs> like there's no <laughs> but there's gonna be a lot more of Kaz okay and we're gonna get a lot more of his backstory so like hold on to your tits now we have Jesper Jesper is Kaz's right hand man this one is like the comedic effect of the stressful book when times get tough he's the one to ease the tension when people start dying he's cackling on the side he's also great with guns everybody knows him to be a sharpshooter and another important character Inej Oh yeah, Inej. You don't even know when she's around, which is interesting because she's one of the primary main characters in Kaz's love interest. So like, yeah, she's always around in this book, but you never know when she is because she's deadly silent when she moves. Her family used to be trained acrobats, so the way that she slithers, climbs, jumps, leaps, just leaps from roof to roof in complete silence, if you see her or hear her, it's because she wanted you to know that she was watching you, and for no other reason. She was called Kaz's The Wraith. That's what the streets called her. Yeah. They also said that she moved like a cat, silently, sneaks up on you, listens to your conversations. Her whole job is to gather secrets for Kaz, and people's weaknesses, and stalk people, and then hands them all over to this dirty hands dude. But Kaz felt like nobody on the streets gave her enough credit. Cats would be jealous of the way that Inej moved. That's what he said. It was as if like she's floating around. She was invisible. Her reputation was almost always linked with Kaz. They were both this mysterious duo that seemed to cheat death and kill a bunch of people. A great foundation for a budding love story if you ask me. Side note, Inej is incredible with knives as well. In fact, she might be too much into knife play. She has names for each knife and whenever she feels anxious, she recites all the names for each of her knives and how she'll use them to decapitate someone, basically. Mm. Yeah, or at least that's what she's planning on doing, okay? She just needs to pay off all of her debt to the drugs. That's the reason that she was Kaz's little cat. He had um, not bought her, maybe more freed her. It's hard to say. It doesn't really matter because right now she's watching Kaz Jasper, and a few other of the dregs, including a guy named Big Bulliger. I'm gonna call him Big B. That was his nickname. And she's watching them getting ready for the parley. The parley. What you're wondering, well, it's the parley. It's when you meet up either for a fight or a truce with your enemies on neutral territory. A civil conversation at best, a physical altercation at worst. The key component is that you must be unarmed. Both parties must come unarmed into neutral territory. It's like a meeting. It's a Zoom call. Side note, we have a few other key players in the book, but they don't come around till later. So 
Back to the parley. The dregs are headed to the exchange, one of the few remaining parts of Ketterdam that has not been divided by the gangs. In fact, this exchange is basically like Wall Street. It's used by the merchants to trade stock and to invest in businesses. And it's almost a symbolic place for the gangs because it screams neutral territory. This is a heavily guarded area. You can't just shoot people. Like if you kill a gang member inside of the exchange, it's gonna go down. Mm -hmm. But nowhere is really neutral, especially not right now. They were on their way to meet with Giles and his guy. So Giles is a member of the rival gang, the Black Tips, and he was a bit of a hothead, violent guy. He tried to make Kaz his nemesis, but he wasn't nearly as clever as Kaz. Or at least that's what Kaz was thinking to himself while he walked over to the exchange. When you go and you meet with the other gangs, you can bring two right-hand men. Two men, right? Two little foot soldiers. So Kaz is bringing Jasper on one side and Big B. They were going to be his wingmen for the night. Giles would show up with two of his closest gang members as well. But of course, Kaz has an ace up his sleeve. An as edge. Oh. She would be hiding out, stalking him to make sure that Giles wasn't up to any funny business. Kaz had warned her in advance that he had a feeling that Giles might have tried to buy off some of the guards. Now, at the exchange, the guards actually guard from the roof. So they have their rifles, they scan the roof, and they look directly down into the courtyard of the exchange. That's how they do it. So what's going on? They're making a deal or what's going on? Yeah, Giles wanted to meet up with them to talk business without, um, because if they had met on any other territory, they're free game to shoot each other and kill each other. <laughs> okay. So Jesper turned to the rest of the drugs before they left, and he said his go-to line throughout the book, no mourners. No what? Mourners, like no people crying. And then the rest of the group say, no funerals. That's his grim way of saying good luck. Mm. And they go into the exchange. Inej had to find a bit of a way, um, a bit of a more unconventional way into the exchange, typically by climbing the walls and the roof. She had no problem with it. She had these very special shoes that she had paid a Grisha fabricator for a while back. They're leather slippers with bubbly rubber soles. They were perfectly fitted to her feet and it gripped any surface. They were the reason that she was gonna climb up onto the roof and why she was so damn good at it. So from the roof, she could see the guards stationed at the top railing looking down into the courtyard. The parley was gonna take place. She could see all of it. She climbed higher and higher until she had full view and she could see Giles, the enemy, walk in with two men by his side, Elzinger and Uman. They were scary. And as for physical weight classes, Elzinger was huge, like nearly seven feet tall. Inej was relieved that Kaz had brought Big B because he's, you know, well, big. And Jasper, he is a sharpshooter that would, more importantly, do anything for Kaz. She glanced around, looking for the guards, but they had vanished. She couldn't locate them. She surveyed the area, and she saw that the guys down in the courtyard were checking for weapons. Big B cleared Gills. Jasper cleared the other guy, Uman, and he cleared, um, Elzinger. And would you look at that? Elzinger had a knife hidden up his sleeve. Jasper tossed it to the other side of the courtyard, just clink clank and away. Okay, these are the lemon bars though. We're gonna go stick them in the oven for like 25 minutes. <laughs> Kaz and Gills, they make small talk. You know, the normal things that you wanna talk about with the person that you wanna murder. But they're supposed to make a truce and shake hands and that they would respect the rival gang's territories. That was the deal, right? And Nej was getting nervous, just eavesdropping on them. But Kaz looked at ease. I mean, he always did. He was dressed in a perfectly tailored suit, listening to Giles drone on and on about how the Black Tips deserved more of the territory. He demanded that the Black Tips get to share the fifth harbor with the dregs. So the harbor is where a lot of these port ships will come in and they have to pay a percentage to the dregs to be able to land there or dock there and like do all of these things. From there, the dregs will also lead these people to their gambling houses, these sailors mm -hmm. to their gambling houses where they make even more money. Kaz scoffed. Look, he had built the Fifth Harbor to be what it was. The ducks were nothing before he got there, but he built a whole ecosystem around it for the sailors to drink, gamble away in the dens. He had done that. Nobody wanted a piece of the ducks when they were sh and now, now you want something for nothing? I don't think so. He said, fifth is ours. It's not even up for negotiation. Besides, you intercepted one of our boats a few nights ago with a big shipment of drugs inside. Look, I know it's your default state, Giles, but don't try to play stupid with me. I know what you did. Giles, being much older, middle-aged man, maybe balding. He said, I hate to admit this, but Brecker, you really are the spine of the whole operation for the drugs. You know? Wait, what is it? Like, Brecker, Kaz, is the spine of the organization. And you know what happens when a spine snaps? 
The dregs come crumbling down. Uh-oh, he's trying to kill him? <laughs> well, Gills, if I wasn't here for peace, I would say that sounds a bit like a threat, wouldn't you? Listen, you cocky little child, Brecker. You don't own the streets. You're nothing but a housefly. Every few years, a new crop of you little kids show up ready to try and make some money. You're not everything you think you are, Brecker. Besides, what if I told you? The two guards patrolling tonight, they have their rifles pointed at you and your two little minions right now. Inej panicked from above. She had to get to the guards before they could shoot Kaz down, right? Mm -hmm. And Gills continues. The dregs won't last a week without you, Brecker. Even in the face of death, you're still so smug. Can't wait to wipe that look off your face. Then do it. Inej wanted to kill Kaz herself. She needs time. Why the hell is, be is he being so aggressive? Did he think that she already had gotten to the guards and stopped them from getting their guns? <laughs> uh -huh. She starts panicking, scanning for the guards on top of the roof, and Kaz keeps pushing him. I'm serious, Gills. Stop blabbing and tell them to shoot. <laughs> Jesper's laughing nervously. <laughs> Kaz, hold on, Kaz, hold on. I'm trying to die right now. Gills smirks. Fire. A bullet slices through the air and hits Big B in the stomach and he falls to the ground. And Jesper dives to his side and is like comforting him. Fucking Gills, are you out of your mind? You just violated neutral territory. Yeah, and who's gonna know? Dead man can't talk. Kaz raised an eyebrow. Nothing about this shocked him. But Inej was freaking out on the rooftop. Jesper's trying to stop Big B's bleeding and Kaz is just standing there holding the crow of his cane. Kaz, Big B is bleeding real bad. We gotta do something. He needs a medic. Good. What he needs is to thank me later that I had the guards shoot him in the stomach and not between his eyes. Inej looked down and Jasper's looking up at him like, what are you talking about? Meanwhile, Gilles and his men look nervous. William Holst, the guard you paid off, right, Gilles? And the other one, Van Dahl, correct? The ones you emptied all of the black tips coffers to bribe? Well, that's where you messed up. Holst likes to gamble, so of course he was down to make a quick buck when you approached him. But gambling debts are the least of his worries. Like, I'm not gonna divulge in any details, and besides, secrets are meant to be kept. But you'll just have to trust me. He has worse problems than gambling, and it's really, really bad. Isn't that right, Holst? And a gunshot runs through the air, and the bullet strikes near Giel's feet. Inej scans for where Holst was and she spotted him, but what about the other guard, Van Dahl? What if Kaz had nothing to do with him and had nothing on him and he was just buying Inej enough time to get to him? She hears Kaz downstairs urging, egging Gilles to tell the other guard to shoot. Take a gamble. So Inej is like, did Kaz get to him or not? So Gilles screams, shoot him. And she gets there just in the nick of time and slips a blade around the guy's throat. So the guy was not bought off. And she says, shh. And he's saying, please, I, 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 I like it when men beg, but it's not really the best time now, is it? And she drags him down. Why does he keep like urging him? Because they want to know the location or what's going on? I don't know. I guess Kaz is just ballsy and he really trusts Inej with his life or something, <laughs> oh, okay? And Gilles is, he's pissed. He gets in Kaz's face and he says, you think you're smart, don't you? You think you're always one step ahead of the rest of us? But that's just what you think, Brecker. And in a dramatic fashion, he whips out a pistol from his jacket. Inej freezes. Kaz doesn't even flinch. Kaz just says, took you long enough. I would have thought tonight was some sort of performance with how you were dragging it on. And now, Jesper, you can stop bending over Big B with those tears pooling in your sad little eyes. And it dawned on Jesper and Inej at the same time. Big B had searched Gilles, but Gilles brought a pistol, meaning, meaning Big B was working for the Black Tips. He was a mole. What? And he was shot by William Hulse, the guard that Kaz had bought, bought off from the bot. You know, get it? So how did Kaz know? And did it even matter? Because he still had a loaded gun pointed straight at his chest. Mm -hmm. Gilles is smirking. Let's see how you try to get out of this one. You can't buy me off. He ignores Gilles with the loaded weapon pressing into his chest. And he, he talks to Big B. You know what your problem is, Big B? Answer me. And he sticks his cane straight into Big B's wound. Come on, take a guess. Fine, I'll tell you, maybe you're in too much pain. But you're lazy. You know that, Big B? Everyone in town knows it, you know it, I know it. So I had to keep wondering to myself why the laziest bouncer in the drugs was getting up early twice a week to walk two extra miles to Cilia's Fries for breakfast, especially when the food there isn't even that spectacular. Big B becomes an early bird and the black tips start messing around Fifth Harbor and intercept our biggest shipment of drugs. Big B. 
This is why you should leave the big plans for the ones with the brains. Yeah? Gilles cocks the gun. And he says, none of that matters now. You're about to get a bullet to the chest. Maybe one day, but not tonight. Again? <laughs> Talk too much. That's what I'm saying. If you're gonna kill him, just yeah. freaking shot, like, shoot See, it. that's the thing with me, right? I see all these horror movies too, like you smack them and you gotta give an ending speech. No, I smack him and I make sure they can't kill me, okay? That's <laughs> called self-defense. Not like, hold on. I wanna thank my mom. <laughs> like, come on now, okay? Anyways, Gilles is like, you don't think I would? No, I, I definitely think you would. It's just, um, and then you hear sirens in the di distance. 19th Burst Strat, right? Your girl's address? She's pretty. Well, pretty enough for an ugly one like you. She also seems kind of kind, naive almost. You like her, don't you? I would say you love her. She lives at 19 Burst Strat. There's two drugs there waiting outside her door. And if I don't walk out of here in the same healthy state with a little skip in my step in a spectacular mood, they're gonna light the place up. Poor Elise trapped in the burning building. I bet her blonde hair will catch fire first, like a little candle. You're lying. You're bluffing. I know. You're sad. You spent all the black tips money on the guards for what? For nothing. Your boss is going to be angry with you, but at least you can go home to your loving girl and lay your head on her lap and tell her about your day. Or we can all die together tonight. It's just up to you. Gilles tensed his finger on the trigger before dropping his arm to the side. Cass smiled and straightened out his shirt. Oh, and uh, before I forget, and with a clean swoop of his cane, he smashes into Giel's wrist, shattering it at the bone. Draw your gun on me again and I'll break both your wrists. You'll never be able to piss on your own again. And then he gave Big B one last word. And you, you may or may not bleed to death tonight, but you have till sunrise tomorrow to get out of town. If you're anywhere in Ketterdam, I'll track you down and kill you myself. And Gilles, if I find out that you helped Big Bull, don't think I won't come for you too. Anyway, better get going. Don't want your girlfriend to get uncomfortably warm. And just like that, he walks out and Jesper stood up, patting Big Bull on the cheek once more. Idiot. And the dregs walk out, one mole down and victorious, for the night at least. They could hear Big B screaming from inside. And Ej thought about helping, at least a part of her wanted to, and she thought maybe she could even put Big B out of his misery, end him fast, or at least hold his hand so that he didn't have to die alone. But instead, she spoke a prayer for him and left. There was still work to do tonight, and traitors aren't worth it. So she quietly follows Kaz out of the building and watches from afar as everyone congratulates him on his big win and they're wondering out loud, how did you know that Big B was a traitor? How, what, how did you orchestrate all of this? Tell me all the ways. Wait, he ba- Wait, can, please, can you just come to the pub with us to celebrate? Kaz refused and said, he starts walking down to the pier alone, which is a very dangerous thing to do, especially after he just shattered the wrist bone of an angry enemy. But Kaz was always a believer that if you don't walk around at Ketterdam at night alone, everyone knew that you were the type to lie down for a beating. Besides, he knew Jesper would want to celebrate with the other drugs, and he knew that Inej was shadowing him. He didn't talk to her, she didn't talk to him. They just walked in silence towards the water. <laughs> Anybody other than Kaz would not have noticed that Inej was around, but I think he was able to spot her. The way that it's described is, after a couple times, there are a few things that you can tell to see where Inej is. He could spot her in a crowd of a million now. In fact, Kaz was adamant on not being the one to break the silence. But there was just something about her that made it feel extra silent. Spit it out already, Inej. What do you want to say? You didn't send anyone to Giel's girl's house to let them know that you're okay. Why waste my time? If Giles doesn't get there in time, is she gonna die? No, she's not. She was never in danger. So you were bluffing. When everyone knows you're a monster, you don't need to waste time doing every monstrous thing. And Ej asked him why he even agreed to go to the parley tonight if he knew he was being set up to begin with. And Cass said, it's a good night if you ask him. Giles used a big chunk of the enemy gang's resources to bribe the two guards. They reestablished their claim on the Fifth Harbor and nobody worthy got hurt. Inej didn't really understand Kaz, not even after the two years. She was the only one that he let him scold him about his greed and how greed was the one controlling him, but he always disagreed. He said that greed bowed down to him, that greed served him. Side note, Inej is a bit more spiritual, so she's what they call a sully, and um, 
Sully's are nomadic people who primarily reside in Ravka, which is where most of the Grisha are. They usually have bronze or brown skin tones with black hair and very deep black eyes, and they face a lot of discrimination from others. It's like the life of a POC never ends, not even in fantasy books, okay? Sully's are known to be incredibly wise, almost on a spiritual level, and they're known to be very, very tenacious. And because Inej still believed in gods and had this spiritualness to her, Kaz loved messing with her. And he knew that he had gotten to her that night because she just gone, disappeared, no noise, just left, not even a goodbye. She went off into the night to do her own little thing. So he smirks and he starts walking back to the Crows Club. That's the drugs gambling den. The Crows is like their logo, like mm -hmm. their, not their logo, you get it. Mm -hmm. um, and when a dark shape appears at the end of the alley. <laughs> okay, so yeah. the girls left. Now uh, he's all alone yeah. and now he's in trouble. Yeah. I knew it. I freaking knew that's gonna happen. And he's like, what business do you have? He swung his cape to hit the figure, but there was no point of contact. He, his cane basically sliced through the air. That's not possible. Mm. That's not possible. And then boom, Kaz was punched in the jaw, knocked out. And as he lay on the ground in the dark alleyway, he sees another figure approach, but not through the alleyway's opening, through the fucking wall. The figure had literally gone through a Wall. He thought he was losing his mind. He must have been punched real good. None of it mattered though, because he saw a syringe get injected into his neck. And Kaz Brecker went into a deep, deep little slumber. I mean, he never seen, um, what are magic people? What did they call He it? did, but no Grisha can do that. No Grisha can walk through walls. Really? No, that's insane power. Oh, okay. This is like yeah. not normal. They're that weak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grisha really have their limits, yes. Um, Other than a couple chosen ones, and like some of the masters that teach the chosen ones in mm -hmm. Shadow of Bone, I believe. I think all the like the MVPs are in Shadow of Bone. <laughs> I think we're dealing with the regulars. We're dealing with mm -hmm. the locals, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so of course, he wakes up tied up and uh, you know, nobody knocks you out in an alleyway to have you wake up gently in a sunset lamp with the smell of eggs on toast, so he's tied up in a sterile room. But at least this wasn't the black tips done. He wakes up in this very luxurious room. If he didn't harbor homicidal rage inside of him, he might have quite enjoyed the lavish surroundings. It was nice. Mahogany everything, books, oil paintings adorning the walls, chandelier suspended in the air, and a man standing on the opposite side of the room. A rich man. He knew he was rich. He had a pin on his lapel the size of a fist. It was a massive ruby. Kaz already knew who this guy was. Vanek, best guess. They're old money, rich people of Ketterdam. They live on the fancy side of town. They run the whole place. And each merchant house has their own crest, like the gangs do. The dregs are the crows. Van X is the red laurel. So he loves red rubies, giant red ruby. Kaz's second best guess was that he was gonna steal that damn ruby. So he's tied up. And Van Eck starts talking, Mr. Brecker, my apologies about what happened earlier. Kaz brought up the fact that he knew the merchant and he even angrily told them that we're basically two of the same cloth, like cut out of the same cloth. We're both trying to make a quick buck off of others. He wasn't trying to get political. He's not trying to start a fight, but Kaz just needed enough time to stall so that he could pick the locks on his handcuffs. They were easy enough. Mr. Brecker, the council of merchants, AKA the people that run Ketterdam, we have a business deal for you. Ah, uh, yes. We too in the streets start all of our partnerships with a beating. Mr. Brecker, consider it a warning. You're a blackmailer. Oh, come on, Van Eck. I broke your information. You're a con artist. I merely create opportunity. A murderer. I kill for a cause. And what cause would that be, Mr. Brecker? Same as yours and everybody else's. For the ever noble cause of profit. Kaz also adds lockpicking to his list of accomplishments, and right at that moment, he lunges out of his chair straight for the merchant. He snatches a sharp letter opener on the desk and holds it up against him. Mr. Brecker, no need for all of this. I have a great business proposal for you. You might change your mind if, after you hear it. I don't care who you are or how big your rubies are. You don't take me from my own streets, and you don't strike a deal with me while I'm in chains. And then it happened. The same figure that he saw in the alleyway, the little boy, walked through the library wall. I mean, he's clearly a Grisha tide maker because tide makers can manipulate materials and, no. right? But no, Grisha magic has its limits. They can't walk through walls. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they get a table and they can take out the wood, they can take out the iron in it, the steel in it, mm -hmm. and make something else of it, but they can't walk through walls. Is he like a high level? 
No, Risha? not even a chosen one. Kaz thought that he was hallucinating, or maybe this was some sort of magic trick. Vanna continues, Mr. Brecker, if you will, I can explain. <clears throat> what you just saw are the effects of Jura Param. You might have heard of Jurda, the stimulant. Relatively harmless, humans take them quite often. Jurda Param is most definitely not harmless. It is the cousin of Jurda, comes from the same plant, but actually, guards, could you please give Mr. Brecker his cane and pistol back? I think we'll have a bit more of a productive civil conversation when he's just pointing his gun at me. This letter opener is quite uncomfortable. So Cass steps back, gets his pistol, sits down, and points it at Van Eck. Keep talking. <clears throat> there is a man, Boyil Bayar. We're gonna call him Bayar, okay? Side note, yeah, we're gonna call him Bayar, okay? Basically, the merchant explains. There is a man named Bayar. He created a drug that, when given to Grisha, it amplifies their powers tenfold. No, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Mika, the little boy that just walked through the walls, he's merely a tide maker. Don't get me wrong, powerful, magical, they can control, you know, a lot of different materials, waters, currents, the moisture in the air. They can literally control the tide. But they aren't like this normally. They can't just walk through a load-bearing wall, Van Eck explains. But with Perem, the tide maker can now alter their own state because the body is made of water, from solid to liquid to gas and back and forth and back and forth, and they can even do that to other objects. The merchant pulled out a few gold coins. He claimed a different Grisha fabricator took Perem and turned lead into gold, which fabricators cannot do. Like I said, they can just take materials out of things that are already existing and turn them into different things of that same material. They can't make gold. Kaz was skeptical. He thought maybe it was just gold the merchant had laying around, but he stretched out his hand to take it anyway. Mm. Nice. I oh, am. Yeah. Smells really good. Oh yeah, I'm so yeah. excited about this while I'm numb. <laughs> anyway, but clearly this type of drug takes a toll on the Grisha, a very heavy toll. Kaz could tell just by looking at the boy. I mean, his body looked emaciated, his eyes were completely sunken in. All he was looking for was his next hit standing in front of Van Eck. He was killing himself by taking doses of Perem. So Kaz wondered, well, what do you want from me? To steal the formula for the drug? A shipment of it? No, Mr. Brecker. I want you to steal the man. You want me to kidnap Bayer? Saving would be the more appropriate word. A few weeks ago, we received a letter from the man seeking asylum here in Ketterdam. He was concerned on what the shoe, so the shoe is a country in the Grishaverse. He was concerned what the shoe were going to do with his formula. They would not use it for good. We were trying to get him out, but during the extraction, there was an ambush. The shoe? No. The Fierda. Side note, Fierda is another country in the Grishaverse, and they're like the main haters. That's what they do. They hate Grisha. They want to kill them. They, you could liken them to witch hunters. Oh. They even have a huge, the highest level of their soldiers, their army, are called the Druskeli, and they're basically witch hunters. It's an honor to become a part of them, and you just go around killing Grisha. That's it. You gather them up and obliterate them all. And now the Fjordans have taken Bayer, and the Council of Merchants are worried. They want to save Bayer, but they can't risk a full-fledged political war, so they need someone to go in and get Bayer out without it coming back to the Council of Merchants. So it has to be like an undercover, not really a government type mm. of... And I think the reason that Bayer was seeking for the Council of Merchants from Ketterdam to help him was that the Shu, they have a lot of, um, they have a lot of things that they want to do. They're like a very ambitious country. So if they had this, if they had the drug, a lot of shit would go down. Fjordans want Bayer because they have skin in the game when it comes to Grisha. They want to kill them all, right? Mm -hmm. And a couple of other countries do. But Ketterdam, they're kind of just like this trade center. Mm -hmm. There's Grisha living there. And the Council of Merchants, they do have their own indentured Grishas. But it's less Grisha-oriented. So Kaz thought it was dumb. Fjordans hate Grisha so much, they would never let this guy make more of this drug. They would just kill him so that his secrets would die with him, right? And Grisha can't get more powerful. But the merchant said that they have every reason to believe that he was alive and being held at the ice court in Fjorda. The minute that those words came out of Van Eck's mouth, Kaz is like, oh, the ice court? Well, then there's no point. There's literally no point. That's basically the high court of Fjorda, a monstrous facility that's like breaking into the most well-protected building in the entire world. And you, you want me to break in and not steal a packet of little powders. You want me to take a whole ass man out of there. 
For what? $10 million? <laughs> yeah, no. What's the point of being $10 million richer if I'm gonna be dead? The ice court is no joke. It's not even, I wouldn't even attempt something like that for $10 million. The two negotiate till the sum reaches $30 million. Just a side note, Kaz would have taken it for 10. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted to do it, yeah, yeah. but he's like, let me negotiate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, what the hell? <laughs> Absolutely, okay. So what is it? His, his whole thing is he wanna, wanna make as much money? Yes, but he doesn't even want to retire. Oh, so he's a little risk taker. And... Yes. I'm gonna, sh there's gonna be something to show you. Okay, so this has been turned me, into wait, 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 almost like an icing consistency. Oh. And then you let it cool on here, they said. So I'm just gonna pour mm. it on. I used a monk fruit powdered sugar. Okay. Wonderful. Now we just let it chill for a minute. That's really tempting to let it chill for a second. That's the hardest part. So anyway, Kaz knew that he needed to split the profits with a team. And he had to give Per Haskell his 20% cut, but still, that's what, probably four million for himself after he had a team of five, six people? That's more than enough to get, to get revenge for what happened to Jordy. Oh yeah, we're getting, we're getting Easter eggs. Who's Jordy? You won't know for another hundred pages. His debt to Jordy would be paid. But that still doesn't answer why the dregs, why Kaz. He asked the merchant straight up and he stated, there's better gangs out there. They're better trained, better equipped, they have better resources. But the merchant smirked and shared a little story. A story of how he had fell in love with this oil painting, one of the most valuable oil paintings in all of Ketterdam and really all of the Grisha verse. One of the most well protected paintings. He had it protected in a safe from a lock that he was told was impossible to pick. He had guards patrolling the safe every single minute of every single day. But it was gone. The thief of the oil painting hasn't even tried to sell it yet, it hasn't hit the market. The merchant was under the belief that the thief stole it just so they could prove it to themselves that they could. It isn't explicitly stated, but it seems like Van Eyck knows that Kaz was the thief. And he's thinking, if this guy can steal from me, he's the only one with a chance that can steal Bayer from the ice courts. But to give Kaz an extra push, the merchant asks him, follow me, I wanna show you something. This is what's gonna happen to the world if Param gets out and is weaponized. He leads Kaz to the back of the mansion into a boathouse. And that's when we find out that this is not Van Eck's house, it's Hode's. And in the boathouse, Kaz is stunned to see lines of guards just standing there, slight smiles on their faces, drooling, soiling themselves. The smell of death permeated through the dock. Some of them had fallen, some of them were dead, some of them were slumped over against the walls, but they all had the same dazed expression on their face. Out of curiosity, Kaz pulled out one of his guns and loaded it and cocked it at one of the guard's temples. He didn't budge. Even though his eyes were wide open, he saw it. He didn't move. Van Eck spoke. They've been like this for a week. You can shoot them. They're about as good as dead. We've tried everything. Hode thought that the Parem was the safest to test on his healer. She was a kind and gentle Grisha. Seemed like the smart choice. So then what happened to the guards? Healer's heal, wouldn't her powers be amplified in that respect? Not exactly, Mr. Brecker. She took control of all the guards and this is what happened. She told the guards to wait. And that's what they've been doing since. That's all they've been doing for the past week. Hode even carved away his own thumb with a big goofy grin on his little face. Cass smirked. Hode had it coming, okay? The councilman was pretty evil. He'd moved since then, but still, it was satisfying to know that the old man was thumbless somewhere. We also find out that the healer, Anya, she had died. At first, she, was, she managed to escape by boat, but the param wore off, and she tried to swim back. To get more param? To get more param. How long did it last? A couple hours. What? Which, honestly, it went against her common sense for her to come back. But it's that addictive. The first dose is fatally addictive. All it takes, one dose, once the drug runs the course, it leaves the Grisha's body weak. The craving is intense, debilitating. In fact, it can be fatal. That's horrifying. Yeah. What the hell? In the end, the two men shook on the fact that $30 million would exchange hands if Kaz could break into the ice court and get Bayur out. They were two businessmen at the end of the day, and a deal is a deal, no matter how illegal it seems. Immediately, Kaz gets to work assembling his team, a heist team, if you will. And the first thing that he does is clear it with Per Haskell, the dregs boss. He doesn't tell him what the, the deal is. He doesn't tell him anything. He just tells him it's a big one. 
And I think he has enough reputation that Per Haskell is like, okay, fine, I don't want to know about it. I just want the money at the end. He's very confident, huh? Yeah, Kaz. Oh yeah, and I mean he has a reputation of delivering, so I, I guess that's why Per Haskell even trusted him. But mainly because when Kaz joined the Dregs, they were nothing. The Dregs were a regular street gang, intimidating shop owners. But now, with the help of Kaz, he had helped him make it into a hot spot. He flipped Fifth Harbor. He let locals invest into the Crow Club, the gambling house. That way, they would send more travelers, tourists, sailors to the Crow Club to gamble away their life savings. Things. And the guy was like a social media marketer. I mean, Kaz was an MLM baddie. He hired people to walk down the street talking about how much money they just made at Crow's Club. Just two friends having an excited conversation about how much money they made, but they were hired. That would get all the passerbys. I want to make some money. Let's go to the Crow Club. I mean, who doesn't want to get lucky? Anyway, once it got approved from per, per high school, the first person he recruited was, of course, Inej. She was hesitant. He was offering her $4 million, but she was still hesitant. And he was honest. He told her, it's an impossible job. I mean, it's near certain death, terrible odds, but at least it's a chance at $4 million, right? He explained some of the details while he chucked off his leather gloves in the privacy of his office. She was the only one that ever saw his hands. She also saw him take off his shirt, so. We're getting steamy. So talking about his body, he has a crow tattoo and he has a black R tattooed on his bicep. She never asked him what the R stood for. Better not be Rachel, okay? Better not be Rachel. But his hands, she couldn't help but stare at them even though this was like her millionth time seeing them. There was a scar that led down the back of his hand, but his fingers were normal. No claws in sight. They weren't stained in blood, just long lock picking slender fingers. You'll find out later why he wears gloves. He dismissed Inej by telling her to collect Wylin. This is a new character, Wylin. And she's confused. She's like, well, wait, if this is such a dangerous big job, maybe we should get someone else instead of Wylin. He refuses, and he orders her to get him a new hat as well. She rolls her eyes and she leaves. Meanwhile, Kaz went to recruit the next one, and this time he would have to travel a bit further than the Dregs headquarters for her. There is a place in the bustling part of Ketterdam called the Emerald Palace. Every time Kaz walks by, he thought about burning it down to the ground. It was owned by a man named Pekka Rollins. It was his pride and joy. The only reason he never burned it down was because he felt like Pekka deserved worse. He reminded himself each time he passed that Emerald Palace that he would get his revenge on Pekka, even if it killed him. He would destroy him. That was the only way Jordy would ever forgive him. It, it had to be painful. Nothing fast, nothing swift. He had to feel every bit of his slow, painful death. Kaz walked by and quickly skirted past all the brothels lined up. Each pleasure house in Ketterdam had their own specialty, but the menagerie was the most famous, AKA the house of exotics, and it's exactly what you think. That's where Inej was when Kaz first ran into her. She was wearing fake Sully silks, and she was basically forced into being a stereotype, a caricature of her own culture, because that's what men wanted, customers wanted. There were other girls there too, all caricatures of their cultures. I mean, they were named after animals. Anyway, that's not where Kaz was going right now. More on that later. He was headed to the White Rose to see a woman named Nina. Nina was an assistant worker. Not that anything's wrong with it if she did it on her own free will. But there was something else that men came to see her for. Nina was a heart render, one of the highest level of Grisha. Very different from a healer, but because she can control blood flow, she can calm a person down from their anxiety or their depression. She's basically a Grisha therapist, but only temporary, of course, but even temporary solutions can fetch a pretty penny. She also plays into the Grisha stereotype, seductress, otherworldly, but in reality, she's just another young girl trying to survive in Ketterdam. She was merely incredibly gifted in cardiovascular health. That was it. When Kaz came to see her at the White Rose, she wasn't surprised. She was a member of the drugs. She even had the tattoo to prove it. Not necessarily by choice, but at least she had protection. Her initial reaction to Kaz even bringing up Parem, she brushed it off. They're just rumors, Kaz. I mean, of course all Grisha have heard about it, there's been whispers, but uh, fake stories. Grisha walking through walls, that's not possible. Even if you were the top, the, even if you've been trained in the little palace, which I've been trained in, it's not possible. We're not capable of stuff like that. Squalors can't fly, tide makers can't turn themselves into mist, okay? Kaz convinced her that Jirda Parem is real and told her how addictive it is. He said he had seen the little boy itching for his next fix, how the soldiers were standing in wait, some even dying from just standing there waiting. 
Nina argued if the rumors are true, then Bayard doesn't need to be kidnapped and saved. He needs to be killed because nobody should have this power over Grisha. Imagine the damage Grisha would do to the world. These are her people. Besides, it wasn't just Nina that Kaz wanted to recruit. If it was, she would have just said no. It was Mateus Halvar, the one person that would truly know his way in and out of the ice court. Nina was pissed. I have been begging you for years to get Mateus out of prison, and now, now that there's money on the line, Kaz, you want to suddenly help him escape prison? Kaz was open with her. Yes, that's exactly why. Because now there's something finally in it for me. I'm not in the business of doing favors, Nina. You should have known that. It seemed Nina was relenting. She would be down for the job mainly because it meant that Mateus would be a free man again. But she warned Kaz, even if we get Mateus out of prison, he's never going to help you guys. He doesn't operate with greed like you do. He's an honest man. He would never want to do this. Kaz said she doesn't know him anymore. Prison changes people. But that night, she would find herself on a little boat with Kaz and a few of his men. These people never sleep. I think they're on Jurda Param, okay? They're on Adderall. They're heading towards Hellgate, the Ketterdam prison located on an island. She was wearing party clothes, which didn't make sense to her. There's no party in session. They're going to prison in the middle of the night. It's not even typical visiting hours. Kaz didn't let her in on the plan. She was completely in the dark, as always. That's the thing with Kaz. He goes into things. Everyone knows their part, but nobody knows the big picture. He made her wear party clothes? Yeah. She's wearing like a fancy party gown and a, like a cute little masquerade mask on a boat to prison. She's like, what the f***, okay? Kaz had paid off a few of the guards because they were being quietly led through the back entrance of the prison, through the kitchen, and through the maze of hallways before they finally end up in a huge atrium. At least that's what it kind of looks like. It's trying to mimic an atrium. They're standing against a railing, and when they look down, they see a circular mud pit. Let's be real. It looks like a viewing ring for them to look down at some sort of fight, like a medieval fight. There's doors lining up around the circular pit, and at the center of the pit, a pool of blood. Other people are all dressed in party attire, huddled around the railing. Nina put two and two together. She felt sick. All these people, including herself that night, had paid the guards to watch prisoners fight to the death. Is that what's going on? The truth was darker. Prisoners would volunteer to have a chance at the pit. They would beg the guards. Guards would invite spectators to come and make money. Spectators would pay to view, but also pay to bet who would win. And the prisoners weren't fighting each other. There was a giant wheel, like a mystery wheel, a game show wheel, and it spun after each prisoner was dragged into the circle, and they would end up fighting a giant creature that was pulled out of the shadow fold. A giant lizard, sometimes a pack of wolves, it just depended. Nina watched as the first prisoner went up against a giant reptile, like a giant lizard. She had never seen anything like it, and Kaz informed her of the poison dripping out of the lizard's mouth, poisonous. The lizard was quick to move. Within seconds, it jumped on top of the prisoner and started consuming him. And the crowd went, boo! They wanted it to last longer. They wanted a real show. This was almost a merciful death, okay? Nina wanted a gag. The fight was run by the Council of Merchants, the politicians. They know what's going on. They let it happen because there's money to be made. Again, Cass said, we're really no different. She didn't know what any of this had to do with Mateus getting out, but she had to sit through a few more fights of prisoners getting ravaged to death by creatures. But at least Inej joined them. She didn't even see Inej sneak up on them. There are no such things as friends in Ketterdam, but Inej and Nina came pretty close. Inej is the one that convinced Nina to join the dregs. Nina had found herself at the menagerie, about to sign a contract with the madam there, Helen, Helene, an, an evil bitch, if you will. Inej convinced her to join the drugs instead. She opened up about how Kaz had freed her from the menagerie. She told Nina, if it weren't for Kaz, I would have died in the menagerie. Yes, but Inej, you could still die with the drugs. It's dangerous. Yeah, but at least I'll die with a knife in my hand, fighting till the last moment. The next morning, Inej helped her sneak out of the Emerald Palace and join the drugs. That same morning, one of the girls was strangled by a customer and nothing happened. They just replaced her with another girl. Nina found a new job at the White Rose, and it was a good choice, but um, anyway, as she's lost in thought, she gets pulled back to the arena when she sees Mateus being dragged out into the pit. She had spent the past year thinking about the next time that she would see him again, and now, now he was the same. I mean, same blonde hair, uh, albeit it was completely shaved down like a prisoner. He had the same blue eyes, but completely different man. There was pure anger in his eyes. Pure anger. There were scars all over his body and his face. Was that her boyfriend? So this is interesting because we find out that Mateus was a Druskelli. 
which is a Fyrdin witch hunter that literally kills Grisha. Hmm. Huh. But they're in love. It, there's some tension there. Yeah, it seems like uh. they're in love. It's a high rank, coveted position, okay? He was rising in the ranks, actually, when he met Nina. Which you're like, why is Nina alive? Because she's hot. That's why. Because a love story needs star-crossed lovers, you know? We don't know quite exactly how they fell in love yet or why he's in prison, but it's interesting. She anxiously stood there watching the wheels spin and spin, and it landed on three wolves. Mateus had to fight three wolves or die. It was the worst thing that could have been chosen. What did they get if they win? Privileges in the prison, like oh. a better cell, you know, better oh. food. Yeah, it's the worst thing that could have been chosen. Technically, the wolves are less deadly than the giant lizard that they just saw in some of the other creatures. In fact, it might be one of the easier creatures to kill. It's not really a creature, it's just a wolf. But Nina knew it would be the hardest for Mateus because Fjordans consider themselves wolves. There's a deep connection between wolves and Fjordans. It would basically hurt Mateus or at least the Mateus that she knew, would never wound a wolf, let alone kill one. And in this case, kill three. The three wolves crouched and they were growling in front of him. Mateus looked at them, just eyebrows crinkled. It looked like he was pleading with them, trying to barter a deal, like, hey, I'm one of you, please don't make me hurt you. But they never listen, do they? The wolves pounce on him and he grabs a bloody knife left behind in the pit, stabs one of the wolves and uses his giant, only existing in book muscles to rip another wolf's jaw apart. But when he glances back up at the crowd, Nina's heart broke to see that he didn't seem angry or vengeful or look victorious. He looked utterly devastated that he had to kill two wolves. And it was in that moment of devastation and grief, the last wolf got the upper hand, bit Mateus in the shoulder, pounced on him, knocked him to the ground, and the crowd went wild. Mateus was struggling, reached for the knife, but then instead grabbed the chains that were once around his hands, wrapped them around the last wolf, and strangled him to death. When he was done, the crowd went crazy. They were stomping their feet. But he put his face up to the last wolf and murmured something. Nina thought it was a prayer. And when he got up, he was crying. She could see all the blood on him. She just desperately wanted to heal him. She's a heart render, but Nina has been working to heal instead of kill. I mean, she'll kill, don't get me wrong. She'll kill anyone, really. But she was practicing on working on her craft because, I mean, she had so much time waiting for Mateus. Mateus was led out of the arena in chains and Kaz told Nina it was game time. He told her first to knock down a few of the guards. She immediately lowered two of their pulses just by putting her hands in the air, putting them into a deep sleep. Inej caught them before they fell, put them up against the bench on the back wall of the arena. Cass slipped off his fancy coat, slipped it around the sleeping guard, making them look like party goers who had gotten too invested in the game. And they look over at Kaz and he's wearing a prison guard uniform. They weren't even surprised at this point. A couple of other dregs are with them, but they're not even surprised. And with Kaz as their guard, the party goers were escorted around the prison for a fun little tour. I mean, they still have to be careful because technically these types of tours aren't allowed and it would be very easy to find out that that's dirty hands, not a guard. Like these prison guards are pretty familiar with these people. Mm -hmm. But Nina was too deep. She's too deep in thought about Mateus. She didn't even care. They go through the maze of smelly, dark, horrendous prison cells before they stopped in front of one, completely dark on the inside, no light. Kaz picks the lock and they enter the cell. Mateus had been put to sleep by a medic to sleep off his injuries. He didn't even realize that there were four drugs inside the room with him. Inej, against Nina's pleas, Inej was the one that was ordered to examine Mateus' injuries mm -hmm. because Nina had a job to do. Make Muzzin, the other drug that came with them, look like Mateus. So Nina can move around your body cells to change your hair color, eye color, loves it, right? But um, she can also give you wounds. Kaz told her, just get it done. Make it look like Mateus. But she can't make them look like twins. She's not, um, uh, what do you call it? There's a Grisha that can make you look like someone, right? But she's mm -hmm. not that good. Mm -hmm. So Kaz tells her, it doesn't matter. We're get we just need time. Mateus is going to get out of here and we need to make Muzzin look like him for at least a day or two and that's it. But to even recreate the injuries on Muzzin's face that Mateus had, they were going to hurt as badly as if he had gotten them in real life, like as if he was fighting the wolves. Mm -hmm. So Muzzin braced himself and Nina starts working her magic. But she was confused. She asked him, why would you agree to this? Money was good. Kaz told Nina that he had every intention of getting Muzzin out, okay? That was the deal. They'll both be free once the job is done. Four million dollars? I mean, that's enough to buy anyone's freedom. In reality, you probably only need like forty thousand dollars, okay? Once Nina was done with Muzzin, she crouched down to Mateus and started to heal him just a bit. Just so he could get up on his- I gotta eat this. I gotta eat this. I can't. I, I can't. It's ready. It. It's ready. It's hard. 
Oh, that icing cuts beautifully. I don't even know if I can call it icing. Like, this whole cake cuts beautifully. You're kidding me don't right talk now. talk so soon before you even... It's like undercooked <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Uh, oh, okay, okay. That's fun. Oh, my gosh. Okay, that's fun. Okay. <laughs> Not good, huh? Okay. I wish it was sweeter. Is this like per not too sweet? Yeah. Type of cake? Uh huh. Okay, then stop. Let me see. Let me see. Stop eating your cake then, huh? <laughs> Let me see. Very sweet. What the hell? Oh, maybe you got a really sweet bite. Because my last bite was a little sweet. But the cake itself is not that sweet. Which is good. Mm hmm. Not bad. Impressive. I like it. It's cooked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's our bare, bare minimum requirement now. They didn't even have time to heal all of his injuries. She felt tears streaming down her face as she touched his face, and she knew everyone was watching. This was a huge weakness, but she said his name twice, wanting to see him again. And he woke up from his slumber. Nina? His eyes opened, and they looked at each other, and he put his hand around her cheek. Nina? Shh. We're gonna get you out of here. But before she could blink, he was on top of her, choking her. What? Trying to kill her. What? Or maybe they're kinky, I don't know, okay. What is going on? Yeah, it was after all, his biggest dream to kill Nina. Mateus had dreamt about it every single day since he got to that prison. Okay, that's not fully the truth. Sometimes he dreamt about kissing her, but he hated those dreams, okay? Those were nightmares. He despised himself after those dreams. Every time he had one of those dreams, he hated himself as much as he hated Nina. He used to call her Little Red Bird, red for the color of her Grisha order. She was beautiful. He had told her that a few times, and he hated himself for that as well. He wished he could take it all back. No, now his favorite dreams were when he chased her down and watched the life drain out of her, and he would finally get his vengeance. He thought he was dreaming again, but when Nina came to say his name, trying to get him to wake up, he reached up and touched her soft, lovely, real face. And then the pain rushed in. His ribs were cracked, he had chipped a tooth, but he still had the energy to try and murder Nina. Dreams or not, he hissed at her, beg me, beg me for your life. Smack. <laughs> Mateus fell to the ground. Kaz had smacked his shoulder with his cane at such a perfect angle that he would not be able to use his shoulder anytime soon. I mean, unless Nina healed it, but she probably wasn't feeling so forgiving right now. Well, Mateus, if you've properly lost your mind, this is going to be harder than I thought. Get a hold of yourself, please. We're here to free you. Mateus groaned. No one ever escapes Hellgate. The guards track everyone leaving, and I'm not going to lose the privileges I just won myself in that match for... for you. Oh, don't worry, you'll be masked, and the guards will be too busy to check. Everyone looked at Kaz confused. Before the group could ask what the hell Kaz was talking about, the screams started, the high-pitched shrieks, screeches. Oh my god, you opened the cages. Well, Jesper was to wait a little longer, but I guess he was feeling a bit punctual tonight. So get up, Helver, on your feet, let's go. Mateus planned on escaping, but just not with them. He glanced at the stair wall, trying to make a run for it, but Kaz put his arm around him. Don't get any funny ideas. We're the only ones that can help you out. We'll let the guards know your plan if you try. The group led him down a maze and later into a tunnel that would open up into the water, since Hellgate is on an island. Jesper was there waiting for them with a boat and a few guns. Mateus was thinking of all the ways to kill everyone. He could push Inej into the water. He wouldn't hurt her, just push her in before they could get on the boat. And then on the boat, he could disarm Kaz and Jesper, and he would be free to kill Nina any way that he wanted. He had to do it now. Inej was standing right next to him, and he suddenly swung left, and she stepped out of the way, expecting it. A bit clumsy tonight, aren't you? They hauled Mateus onto the boat, and Nina knocked him out. The last words he ever spoke before going into yet again another slumber were, I'm going to kill you. So. so what is he good at? Is he a good fighter or what's going on? Typically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But a little clumsy. Yeah, and like kind of hot, I guess. Kind of hot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Who's hotter? Um, he's giving like Thor vibes and Kaz is giving like low-key vibes. So I guess mm. it's more who you're into, right? So super great romantic reunion. I love it. When he woke up, he was in the Crow Club, in a private room, and he knew of Brecker. I mean, everybody did. So Mateus knew him. He could smell Nina. She always smelled like roses. He made him want to puke. And they're all standing around him. Kaz then offers the deal to Mateus. Join us. You're a Druskelly. You know the ice court better than anybody. 
or he was Drew Skelly. Give us all the information you know about the ice court. Because you had been a soldier there. Give us everything we need to know how to break in, how to kidnap Bayura and get out. In the end, even if his country had betrayed him, Mateus would never commit treason against Fjordan. He's like, I'm not doing it. I'm not at all. And Nina's like, see, Cass, I told you he wouldn't do it. Greed is not his language. But everybody has a weak spot. Mateus had been imprisoned in Ketterdam. Even if he had escaped from prison, which he just did, he could never go back. He could never go back home, at least to the way things used to be. Everyone there hated him. He was a disgraced man. But Kaz whipped out a piece of paper. The Council of Merchants has signed a piece of paper, not only forgiving you of your alleged crimes, but pardoning you and apologizing for a wrongful conviction. This was the only way that he could go back home to the way that home was. He could be a Druskeli again. He could be a witch hunter again. Now he was intrigued, but not fully convinced. If Bayer was in the ice court, he was most likely dead. Kaz was annoyed. Why does everyone keep saying that? Dead or alive, Mateus, you still get your end of the deal because it's not money related. You get your pardon. You need to help us in. Mateus finally agreed with much hatred for his new group of thieves that he was binding himself to. He had met each one of them. Kaz, he knew Nina, the one he wanted to kill. Then he just met Inej, Jasper, and who's this? Everyone? This is Wylan. Inej was annoyed. Radke was better for the job. This kid barely knows his trade. Whoa, 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 easy, Inej. You might hurt the little boy's feelings. He's new to the scene. Yeah, he looks new to the scene. What is he, 12? Wait, who is this again? A little boy. Uh, we're meeting a little yeah. boy right now. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm in this room. I can hear you. And I'm 16, not 12. The group all argued that Kaz should have chosen Rasky or Radke, but Kaz shut them down. This is why you guys don't make these decisions. Besides, Wylan isn't just good at his trade. He's an insurance policy. For what? Everyone, meet Wylan Van Eck, Jan Van Eck's son, the merchant man. What? And our insurance for our guarantee on $30 million. Jesper was practically on the ground laughing his ass off. Well, that makes sense. You're the fucking councilman's kid. Oh my god. Very Nepo baby fashion. And Wylan says, no, I'm good at making bombs. I'm good at demolition. Now Kaz, take his turn. You're passable at demo, Wyland. You're excellent as a hostage, though, so keep your hopes high. <laughs> Besides, Wyland doesn't know enough people to cause us any trouble, and he's been to the ice court himself, so it'll keep you very, very honest, Mateus. Meaning, Mateus is going to draw out every section of the ice court, and he could easily lie and f*** the group up. But because wyland has been, he has to be honest. So that night, they start their rough draft of the ice court, and I'm going to put up a drawing in the video version if you're watching, and it's included in the book, but it's basically like the rings of a tree. So the outer layer is a huge circular oh. building, right? And then inside, there's layers and layers, and the center is the most well-protected. That's where the royals of and live. And it's just barriers and barriers and barriers. I mean, the first big circle is the ring wall, security. And even that is divided into three sectors. The prison, the Druskeli facilities for the witch hunters, and the embassy. Even to get to that point, you have to pass by two checkpoints by guards. Then you have the ice moat, which is a wafer thin layer of ice that you can't walk across or boat across because the ice will crack and you'll be plunged into frozen waters where you'll die. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. And more layers of security. The only way across are like a couple of bridges and they're all heavily guarded. More layers of security till you finally reach the white island, the innermost ring of the tree circle where the royals live. Jesper said it looks more like the tears of a cake than the rings of a tree. But Kaz argued it looks more like a target. I digress. Even before you reach the ring wall, the main security wall, you have two checkpoints, and there's tons of gates around the property, but only one is ever being used during the day. The schedule changes every week as to which one is being used that day. It's incredibly secure. There are at least four guards on duty at each gate, and those are the ones that aren't even being used that day. Nobody's going in and out, and they still station four guards. Each gate weighs thousands of pounds, so even if you can get your way past the guards, how are you going to blow it up or open it? If you pick the lock, you can't swing it open, it's thousands of pounds, and if you do, there are alarms that will ring through the entire palace, which, speaking of alarms, there's an elder clock that rings every quarter throughout the entire place. So they decide that they're going to arrange their heist, their kidnapping, by the chimes of the clock. Side note, as Mateus is explaining the place, the group starts to look more and more hesitant. But Kaz, Kaz is confident. And where do you think they're keeping Bayer? Probably in the prison sector, at the highest floor. That's reserved for high security cells. Most dangerous criminals are kept there. The most evil, assassins, terrorists, and what? 
Grisha? Exactly. No, no, no. Kaz says. Bayer is not dangerous in that sense. He's not Grisha. I don't think they'll keep him up there. I agree. I think they'll have him already buried. Mateus, where would they keep a prisoner that's valuable, waiting trial, but everyone wants a piece of him? He needs to be protected. Where would he be kept? Then he'd be inside the White Island. The Treasury and the Royal Palace are the most secure places in all of the Ice Court. Then that's where they have Bayer. Then you're crazier than I thought. There's no way you're going to get in there. There was silence before Nina spoke. The ceremony. Shut your mouth. Cass says, no, Nina, continue. Ignore Mateus. It's the day of the listening. The new Driskelly class are initiated on the White Island. It's a celebration, a party for murderers, a huge celebration where guests from all over the world are invited to party with feared and royals. There's entertainment that comes in as well, and it's on spring equinox. So two weeks from today, the gates will open. Maybe we don't even have to break into ice court. Maybe we walk right in with the performers. A lot of foreign performers will be attending. Mateus shook his head. No, the ice court vets every single foreigner weeks ahead. We're no fools. Inej thought, even if we go, traveling to the ice court will take a week. There's no time to get fake documents and to get vetted by the embassy in the remaining week. Cass marked. And that's why, Inej, we're not going through the embassy. It's too obvious. What's the easiest way to steal a man's wallet, everyone? Knife to the throat? Guns? Poison? Wrong. The easiest way to steal his wallet is to tell him you're going to steal his watch. You take all of his attention to where you want it to be. He'll be so busy staring at his watch, making sure you don't steal it, he won't realize his wallet is gone. The Fyrdens can't be looking everywhere at once. They'll be focused on the foreigners coming in and out of the celebrations. They won't care too much about who gets into the prison. Because the most important part about prisons is not about who goes in, but making sure nobody comes out. And we're going to enter. Wylan was excited. Ooh, are we going to be disguised as guards? No, because only Nina and Mateus speak Fyrden. Wylan, you were taught Fjordan in a classroom. It's not the same. We won't be guards for this one. The best way to not get caught is to enter as honestly as possible. We enter as criminals. The prison is our front door. Everyone sat silent. Wait, I'm sorry. I don't know if we heard you correctly. You want us to let the Fjordans lock us up in their jail. Isn't that everything we're trying to avoid in this whole heist? If we enter as performers, they'll go over every document, every passport, examining embassy seals, criminals. They want to count heads. They want to count crimes. They don't care about your identity. You're getting locked up anyway. Besides, Kaz tried to calm them down by reminding them that he's the best lockpick in the game, so technically they won't be prisoners. Just visiting, like in Monopoly. And once they get to Bayer, all they have to do was give him the code word. Seshuye. It means heartsick in Kirch. That's what the, the councilman had given him. Bayer will come with them willingly, trust them immediately, and the merchant's council, you know, they're telling him, these are the people. Kaz continues. So Jesper, till we leave tomorrow night, you watch Wylan, and Wylan, you watch Jesper. And why on earth would I need a babysitter in this little 12-year-old kid? Because, Wylan, make sure he doesn't mysteriously find himself in a gambling den on his way to buy ammunition with our money. Kaz gave everyone directions on what needed to be done before they set for sale tomorrow. Most of it included buying a ton of random supplies. And before they left, Inej found Kaz alone and she expressed her concerns. She's smart. She knew that they weren't going to be the only ones after Bayer. What everything Venek had said was true. The Shu would send armies, trained operations, spies. Everyone would be going after Bayer. Kaz shrugged her off. Clearly it's not a job for trained soldiers and spies. Venek knows thugs and thieves will do better. That's why we've been hired for the job. Well, what does the job mean if you don't live long enough to spend the money, Kaz? There's a difference between confidence and arrogance, you know? Kaz kind of not blew up on her, but he told her, look, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Nobody's forcing you. I can replace you with someone else for the team. She said, there's no one as good as me. You need me. He said, I need your skills, Inej. I don't need you. It's not the same thing. You may be the best spider crawling around the barrel, but you're not the only one. You'll do well to remember that. She stormed out of the office, but as much as she hated him in the moment, she knew that she would never leave his side. I mean, there was a reason that she stuck by him. Technically, she could leave any time she wanted without paying her debt to the drugs. They wouldn't even hear her going. But she didn't. Because Kaz put his neck on the line for her, and without her, he would be vulnerable. And she knew it. But she was pissed. She went out to carry out her duties, and when she walked by the menagerie, the house of exotics, she tried to avoid it at all times, but she was running late. She seethed with anger and she remembered each girl was dressed as an animal. 
Her nickname was Little Lynx. Girls would change, but the animals would remain the same. She tried to walk past as fast as she could, shedding herself of those painful memories, but a voice stopped her. Hello, Little Lynx. She turned around, and it was Helene, the madam, covered in jewels that she bought off the hard work of her girls, the girls that she beat, tortured, and basically killed, and sold to men. Inez tried to run, but Helene's henchmen stopped her. Where are you going, my little lynx? That's not my name. You're still pretty, you know. Could still charge a pretty penny. More time that you spend with that thief Brecker and you might not be so lucky. Inej was frozen in fear. She couldn't breathe. She felt like the walls were closing in on her. Maybe it's time you come back home to me, little lynx. You wouldn't dare, Helene. The dregs, they- Ah, yes, the dregs. For now. But I promise you one thing, little lynx. You will wear my silks again. Inej froze before they walked off. She had to force her legs to run to the pier where she was supposed to be meeting the group so that they could set sail for Fiorda. And on the way, her breathing finally returned back to normal and she tried to convince herself that she had nothing to fear. She wasn't Little Lynx, she was the Wraith. But when she w got to the dock, she was late, she's running, running, she sees them all gathered in front of the boat about to board with her. And right before she makes it, the man that was supposed to help sail them. So a couple of other dregs are coming, but they have no idea what's going on. They just know that they're getting paid to bring them to like Fiorda and stuff. Mm -hmm. Dirix, he's meant to sail with them, falls down in front of her, and there's a knife sticking out of his neck. She what? makes brief eye contact with Kaz before all hell breaks loose. The boat they were supposed to be boarding blows up, sending the group flying onto their backs on the docks. The entire dock is getting showered and bullets and people are stabbing random dregs. Jasper knew that they were outnumbered and their transportation was now a fireworks display, so that's great. The group split up, Jasper with Wylan, as they start loading up their bullets. Jasper's trying to shoot down as many enemies as possible, but it's rough. There were way too many coming from just all different directions. Wait, just a sudden attack out of nowhere? Yeah. Kaz found them and um, told them to head east to the next dock and board the boat parked at 22. There he goes with his backup plans. The boat the enemies blew up was a decoy. Jasper was annoyed that Kaz didn't tell him, but Kaz told him that would defeat the purpose of a decoy. And at least they had backup. So all they had to do was just make it there without, you know, dying. Jesper with Wylan, Nina with Mateus, Kaz was split up from the group and so was Inej. They were all fighting for their lives. Jesper and Wylan were the first to make it to the boat. And from there, Jesper was shooting the enemies at the nearby dock where his friends were. And he just kept telling himself every part of his body ached for four million dollars. That's what he needed. That's what he needed for his dad to erase his debt, to help his family. Wylan screamed at him, close your eyes, Jesper, close your eyes. Jesper closed them and immediately a big screech filled the air and he could see a bright flash of light even with his eyes closed. Wylan had set off a flash bomb and dozens of men were being blinded by it on the docks. Maybe including their own, so that's great. Inej was trying to take down as many of the enemies as she could, so she started climbing up onto the, the crates that were piled high on the docks and used it as a way to sneak up on the enemies and kill them. Each kill, she said a little prayer in her head. Two years ago, it would have been a big deal for her to kill anyone but she was used to it now. Anyway, she saw tattoos on the men. The first one, black tips. The second one, black tips. But another one, razor goals? A different gang, they're not even friendly with the black tips. Had they all banded together to go against the drugs? That didn't make sense. How do they even know that some of the drugs were leaving today? Inej was climbing up another stack of crates when her ankle was grabbed and someone yanked her down harshly. Umin, Gil's enforcer, remember? from the, the parley in the beginning. Mm-hmm. He took one look at Inej and he whooped with joy. Holy shit, I have the wraith. And he stabbed her on the side. Blood starts pooling and she coughs. You should have aimed higher. You missed my heart. No, no, no. Wraith, I don't need you dead. I can't wait to hear all the little secrets you've gathered for Brecker. Oh shit, this is good. He slammed up against her as blood splurted from her side. And Inej asked him if he knew the secret to fighting a scorpion. Don't lose your mind before you spill all your secrets, Wraith. The secret is, never lose sight of the tail. She clicked her heels and remember those rubber shoes? Once she clicks them, tiny silver blades adorn the bottom of her feet. Mm -hmm. And she jammed them into his legs. He screamed, she freed herself from his grip and starts climbing up the crates, but she feels so dizzy. She told herself to fight a bit more. She just wanted to stop though. The blood was coming out fast. She just wanted to lie there and let the pain take over. She could hear them taunting her. Come on down now, Wraith. You have secrets to tell us. Can't wait to hear the stories. 
She wanted to just lay on top of the crates until she died. At least that way, they couldn't get to her. Maybe she should take her own life. Better die to buy her own blade, right? She grabbed the knife and put it up against her wrist. And then a voice came. Not just yet, Inej. <laughs> <laughs> she was scooped into somebody's arms and they hit the ground hard. She knew his bad leg was in pain. Okay, she knew. But he kept running to the boat where everybody was waiting. And she said, did we win? I'm here, aren't I? And he kept urging her to talk to him and not get sleepy, stay with him, but she just wanted to sleep. Before she knocked out, the last words she said to him were, say you're sorry. For what? Just say it. But like, those will be my last words too. Because <laughs> I say that a million times. Just say you're sorry. <laughs> and he's always like, for what? I'm like, for existing, okay? <laughs> so annoyed with you. <laughs> okay? So Kaz rushes aboard and screams that they need to get out of there. People start running to the dock. They need to get out ASAP. Kaz had never felt so much pain in his life, but he didn't care. Everyone tried to offer to take Inej from his arms, but he refused. <laughs> he personally ran down to where Nina was and demanded that she fix Inej. Kaz, I'm a heartbender, not a healer. She's lost so much blood, her pulse is weak. Fix her. Get to work now. Nina was nervous, not just because Inej was her friend, but because Kaz had like a feral look in his eyes, you know what I mean? <laughs> he left the room because he needed answers. He saw Uman tied up on the deck, and everyone thought that he was just going to get answers from Uman, and I don't know what they were expecting next, but Kaz says he's unhinged now. He demanded to know who tipped them off. Why did you guys come back to ambush? Not just black tips, but all the gangs. Uman said it was Giel's, but Kaz knew Giel's brain was small enough to fit into the toe of his boots. To incentivize Uman, Kaz cut an X across one of his eyes and scooped out his eyeball and threw it into the sea. Oh, Uman screamed, Giel's loaned money from the, Giel's loaned money and gathered some of the razor goals for the job. They thought that they would all be aboard by the boat by now by the time that it blew. We thought that you guys were all gonna die in the explosion on the boat. But it wasn't Giel's who hired everyone. Where did he get the money? It was, Pekka Rollins, Who's that? the guy that Kaz wants to kill, the owner of the Emerald Palace. Oh. Huh. Kaz was shocked. His mind was spinning. Jasper was as white as a ghost. Jasper said, well then, if Pekka Rollins is after us, we're screwed. Kaz believed Pekka Rollins was wiping out his competition, which means that he knew that they were going to Fjordan, and that meant Pekka was sending his own people to Fjordan too. Possibly he was going too. So everyone's chasing after this dude right yeah. now. Okay. Kaz personally escorted Uman to the side of the boat and plunged him straight into the waters. At least that way he could be joined with his other eyeball that he'd so desperately cherished. And he told him before he killed him, my wraith would advise me to take mercy on you, but she's not here thanks to you. Everyone on the boat was silent. Nobody had seen Kaz in this unhinged state. Like one thing was very clear if it wasn't already. Inej was his weakness, his soft spot. Whether he really needed her alive for this mission or if he just needed her alive in general is still up for debate. Nina worked all night to keep Inej's heart pumping, but it was a faint pump, but it was something. She knew it was more than a mission to Kaz because she could hear it. Every time Kaz looked at Inej, his heart would beat a bit faster. And while Nina was caring for Inej, she noticed two things. One, Inej didn't have a dregs tattoo, the one that everyone was required to have. And second, Inej had a big piece of skin on her arm where the menagerie branded tattoo of a peacock used to be. Someone basically skinned her, like taking it off of her, not doing a great careful job. And it just broke Nina's heart. She held Inej's hand while she dozed off, and she dreamt of the night that she was captured by Mateus and his crew of witch hunters. She thought he looked like a painting. She knew what he was the minute that she saw him. They all had the iconic gold hair, pale blue eyes. She had studied them for years. Her entire time in the second army for Ravka, which is reserved for Grisha, she had studied these witch hunters. She had studied the Druskeli. They wanted her dead. She had to know her enemy. She even learned Fjordan, the enemy's language. But seeing one up close was magical. Until he pulled out his rifle and pointed it at her. She lifted up her hands as a defense mechanism, and that was a grave mistake. Another soldier was waiting to tie her hands up. He was testing her. Any other girl human would have screamed or blocked her face or reached for a knife. Only a Grisha would raise their hands up in defense. He captured her and threw her into a cell filled with captured Grisha on their way to free Yerda to be tried for their crimes of just existing. Then they would be executed. He was on the boat. Nina finally met the infamous General Brum. 
His reputation precedes him. He was one of the most ruthless generals. He killed Grisha. He went to Grisha territory to drag Grisha out of their homes to kill them. He was, he was disgusting. He was vile. Nina had joined the second army to kill him. But here she was, dirty, starving, soiled in his cages. Nina tried to reason with the guy, Mateus, that had imprisoned her. She spoke to him in Friurden. Your commander wants us to be tried for our crimes, but can you tell me what crimes we've committed? Espionage, crimes against the people. You'll have a fair trial when you get there. It's more than you deserve. And how many Grisha are ever found innocent? He tried to walk off, but she begged, wait, please, water, water, please. He walked away without even looking back, but he did bring her a cup of fresh water. He would not come back for days, but that tin cup would save her life. And now Mateus wanted to kill her again. So what's new? She tried to tell him on that boat. I stayed back in Ketterdam. I didn't want to. I wanted to go back to Ravka to join my family, but I stayed back because I was looking for a way to get you out of Hellgate. I couldn't leave without you. And he scoffed. That's funny because you're the one that put me there. It was a mistake. I saved your life and you accused me of being a slaver and, they, and then they threw me into Hellgate. And I spent all of last year trying to make things right. It was clear that he wasn't going to be forgiving her anytime soon. But every time something happened, even when someone brewed some fresh coffee, it took everything in Mateus to not want to bring Nina a cup. He tried to tell himself though, that's what Grisha do. They seed weaknesses inside of humans. They manipulate. So while on the boat, a few things happen. One, Kaz brought up an invention that he had purchased. It's a pack, it's like a, reminds me of a Tide Pod, okay? You put it in your mouth and you bite down, it explodes. And when it does, this air bubble comes out of your mouth and covers your nose, letting you breathe for a little while. Clearly, this is gonna come in handy later, but for what? I don't know. Let's say that you try to cross the ice moat and you sink. Breathing is the least of your concerns. Most likely you'll freeze to death first. Mm -hmm. Which, side note, Wylan wondered out loud where the water was even coming from. The ice court is built on a hill. So is there a hidden aquifer or an aqueduct or something to bring in water for the ice moat? He's a curious cat, you know, he liked to understand things. Nobody else seemed to care. Jasper cared, but not for the purposes of the heist, but it seems like the two had this light enemies to lovers trope. They're not really enemies, they just bicker and tease each other. Who and, and who? Jasper and Wylan. And I don't think- Wait, Wylan is the kid? Yes, but I think they're both the same age, okay? Oh, okay yes, okay. yes, so <laughs> okay. don't call the cops, don't Jeez. call the cops, okay? But they're just like teasing each other and I don't think they end up officially getting together in this book, I heard, but there's strong chemistry there. So there's a lot of love lines in this one to follow. Mm -hmm. And they start making plans. They were gonna enter as prisoners into the prison sector, but most likely BR was not being held there, which meant that they needed to get out of the prison sector and into the innermost secured layer of the ice court, which wouldn't be easy as the prison isn't connected to the white, like the inner layer mm -hmm. for obvious security reasons. But the roofs, some of the roofs were connected. So that's what they would do. They would climb up to the roof, but the only way to do that is through the prison incinerator, where they burn things and a chimney leads all the way up to the roof. You would have to climb through the incinerator. It doesn't operate all day, just in the mornings. So by the time that they need it, it will hopefully have cooled off. Inej will free climb up first and then tie a rope and send it down for the rest of them to climb up. Nina was pissed when she heard this. Inej, Kaz was confident, the Wraith can do it. The Wraith? She's lying unconscious on a table right now. She might not even survive the night. Don't act like you really care. But Inej did survive the night. Inej woke up and Nina was stunned. It had been nearly four days that they had been on the boat and Nina was just grateful to whatever saints that she prayed for that Inej was alive. Curiously, Inej asked Nina to not tell Kaz. She just wanted the night to herself. And Uman did this. How did he know that we were leaving? Inej, it's okay. Uman is dead. Kaz killed him. And he actually went back later for a lot of people that went after you. There was enough blood to paint a barn red, it was said. He was afraid for you. You should have seen his face when he brought you on the boat. Yeah, because I'm a valuable investment. Tell me he didn't say that. Oh my God, that f***ing idiot. Oh my God. Nina asked about why she didn't have the dregs tattoo. And Inej said, I know it's a requirement, but Kaz told me it was my choice and that he wouldn't be the one to mark me again. Nina smiled but Inej knew Kaz did mark her, just in a different way. <laughs> in the heart, okay, in oh, the wow. soul. 
And then she wanted to fall back asleep. So she had Nina sing for her. Terrible singer, by the way. And as she drifted, she thought about how her life led up to this. She wasn't even supposed to be in the family's caravan. Inej lived in a caravan with her parents, and she had slept in late. Her parents were out, and she just begged for an extra hour to sleep. Men broke into the caravan and kidnapped her. She was auctioned off in Ketterdam, sold to Madame Helene, and forced to work at the menagerie. So on this boat, we get a lot of backstories. We don't necessarily know why Wylan left home, why he went from being a merchant's son to living on the barrel streets in the bad part of town, but Inej does reveal that she tried to bribe some of the servants at Van Eck's house to find out. She doesn't tell anyone if she knows the real reason, but she did intercept letters from Van Eck, the father, to Wylan, and it seems like the choice to leave was Wylan's. Van Eck, the merchant, was begging him to come back home. He wrote letters and it would read, if you're reading this, then you know how much I wish to have you home. I pray that you read these words and think of all that you've left behind. Please. That sounds just a little rebellious. Maybe. <laughs> a piece of pertinent information, though, is that Inej notices Kaz's obsession with Pekka Rollins, even though he tries to hide it. Was he, Pekka Rollins again? The guy that owns Emerald Palace that he oh, really wants revenge on. Right. He regrets this later, but he does tell Inej on the boat that Pekka Rollins killed his brother, Jordi. And that's why. Inej tells him once that she gets her share of the money, she's gonna leave Ketterdam and never look back. Kaz is conflicted with this new revelation, but like, what's he gonna do? All he could do was spend his days planning the heist that would in one way or another rip Inej from him, whether they end up in jail, dead, or with her leaving with $4 million. And reminiscing about his brother's death. So a little bit about Kaz. Kaz and his brother Jordy were raised on a farm when their father had died. They were too young to keep up with the farm, so their only choice was to sell it and head for Ketterdam with their entire life savings. Jordy, his older brother, said he was going to find work as a runner for the exchange, basically an errand boy. Then one day he would work his way up and up and up and up until finally he was a stockholder, like a full-fledged businessman. Meanwhile, Kaz would go to school. But Ketterdam is not a nice town. Nobody wanted to hire Jordy. Nobody. Nobody at the exchange. So for weeks, they lived worried about their next meal till finally, their luck changed. A merchant wanted to hire Jordy, Mr. Hurtsoon. He wasn't the best merchant on the block, but he was a nice man with a wife and a child that wanted to make a name for themselves. Jordy just ran errands for him and sometimes placed orders for him at the exchange. They were allowed to spend some time at the Hurtsoon house where Mrs. Hurtsoon would make sure to stuff their bellies. It was the first time that Kaz felt safe since his father had passed. Mr. Hurtsoon even let them invest in small, small little deals, okay? Like sugar insider trading. I'm serious. So he had gotten word that a lot of sugar farms were burning down. So he bought up all the sugar, sold them for high because of the scarcity. Jordy make a, made a quick profit. But the next time an opportunity came around, Jordy saw dollar signs in his eyes. He couldn't look back. He wanted to invest his entire life savings. Mr. Hurtsoon said, absolutely not. No, that is not what you do. That is literally the last thing you do in this line of business. Meanwhile, he was kind of a hypocrite because he was also betting everything that he had on this. Mm. Yeah, and he kept telling Jordy, you're a good lad. Someday, I have no doubt that you're gonna be the king of the exchange, but you do not have the funds for these kinds of investments. I do, I have the sale of my father's farm in the bank. How many times do I tell you that is not how you play the game? A child your age has no business in something like this. Do not risk that. I'm not a child, Mr. Hurtsoon. And if it's a good opportunity, and you're willing to bet everything on it and do this for your family, then I should be able to do this for me and my brother. After weeks of pleading, Jordy convinced Mr. H to let him invest. But because they were minors, they had to fill out official bank paperwork that said that Jordy loaned Mr. H their savings. So technically, Mr. H was also going on a limb for Jordy because if the investment failed, Jordy could show up with these paperwork and say, Mr. H hasn't paid me back mm, for the loan. Wow. Yeah. Jordy said that he would never do that, though. That week, Jordy and Kaz lived for once. I mean, they bought a new pair of socks, they ate waffles, they purchased a book at the bookstore, I and mean, they truly lived. And at the end of the week, they went to see Mr. H, and the entire house was empty. Everything was gone. What does that mean? Jordy convinced himself that they were gone for a while, and he sat on the doorstep. But eventually nightfall came. They knocked on the neighbor's door and she turned them away and she told them, they haven't been living here for years. That guy rented it for a few weeks and he's gone now. And slammed the door in their face. Wait, what does that mean? He took their money and ran. Did he invest it in it? 
Oh, he just stole the money, that's it? All of it was a scam. Even the bank paperwork, scam. Oh, the whole good guy persona, like looking out for him was, oh my god. Their <sighs> life savings was there, and then it was gone. Oh my god. As the boat got closer to Fjorden, Nina had to work on disguising Mateus. He was too recognizable. She had to change his eye color and his hair color. And once they landed, they start their trek. The boat's captain was um, to wait till the specified time and day and meet them again at the docks. He was their only way off the island, so that's great. But that's the least of their worries. The entire land is covered in snow. They have to trek miles to get to the ice court or to even get to a local town. They didn't call it the ice court to be cute. The whole country was just fucking ice. They even had to wear sunglasses because the reflection on the snow was so bright it could easily blind them. But Mateus was like, ah, oh, home. I like it. So as the group walks towards the ice court, which would take days, they start discussing the plan in further detail. And I think this is when we see that every single person there has their own little motive. Most want to find Bayer and make sure that he's alive and secured to bring in for the money because they want the money. That's mm -hmm. their motive. But Mateus and Nina, they don't. For once, their goals were aligned. Mateus didn't want Bayer to live because he didn't want the evil Grisha to become even more evil and even more powerful. Nina didn't want Bayer to live because she's Grisha. She had seen how controllable the Grisha became. They would become weapons of mass destruction and not even by their own free will. She had to do this for her own people. It reminded Mateus of them washing ashore together. Remember how she was trapped in the cages in the boat after the shipwreck? The boat sank. Mateus was in the water, cold, drifting deeper and deeper into the ocean, but also drifting asleep, when out of nowhere he felt warmth just like radiating from his chest. And then it filled his whole body and all the parts in his body that used to ache, they were no longer aching and he was wide awake now. He looked down and uh, Nina was hugging him from the chest and she was screaming, wake up you miserable lump of muscle. He panicked, it was the witch, but the warmth, he needed it so he didn't want to push her off and she had technically saved his life. He thought for a moment, and then he started swimming towards land. He could hear her cry in relief because she had no idea if he was gonna save her. She could have easily used all this energy to wake him up, and then he could have literally pushed her off and swam to shore by himself. So like that, for hours, he swam for the both of them, and she would use all her energy to make sure no part of his body was aching so that he could keep going and that he didn't feel cold. Wait, so she's like koala him while yeah. he's swimming in the ocean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. come on now. Come on now, you can't even swim a lap in the pool <laughs> without me koala you. Have you guys seen him flopping around in the pool before? It's good, it's so sick. Okay, it was energy sucking for the both of them and during that long cold night he had asked why did you save me? Because because you're hot Because <laughs> <laughs> you're human Mateus didn't believe her. She was a deceiver. That's what Grisha do But they made it ashore and he starts walking soaking wet up to the beach to try and find shelter for the night And he realized that on land Nina had used up all her energy and she had fallen in the sand She could not get back up he had no doubt that if he just kept walking, he would have been saved and she would die on that very beach. He walked a little and then he turned back and picked her up from the sand and threw her over him. And they found shelter in an abandoned tent and created a fire, but it wasn't enough because they had to keep each other warm throughout the night. Body and they, heat. they had to do oh, it yeah. naked because their clothes were soaking wet. Oh. So good, so good. Yeah, so good, so, so good. So creative. So, so good. Sad. So uh, he has hated her every single day since then. <laughs> but why was it so hard for him to not worry about her? <laughs> or look at her when they were walking. So like, is he going to be our Fjordian daddy or what? He better not betray us. He better not. But let's go over the group's plan. Their plan is to get into prison, climb up the incinerator, get onto the roof, use the roof to get to the white island, the innermost layer part of the ice moat. And it's not really specified what their plan for the ice moat is and how they're gonna cross it, but it seems like they have one. They're gonna get to Bayer, secure the goods, get him out, and how do they get out? Cass says, we walk. It's like a, he didn't say this because this didn't exist then, but it's like TSA. The gate is so focused on guests coming in, people leaving are not security risk anymore but they're bringing bombs just in case they had to run out and their plan was to blow up the bridge from the ice moat so that it would be hard for the soldiers to chase them down. From the ice court, they still needed to go about seven miles to get to their uh, boat that was waiting for them, but they had no other choice. That's why the bombs were considered cautionary luggage. 
A few things happen while they're trekking through the snow. Most of them were used to the dampness that Ketterdam had, but this level of cold, it hit their bones. Matea starts walking first. He explains they can't eat the snow because it'll only dehydrate them. He's taking the lead when he screams, stop! But it was too late. He watched in slow motion as Nina gasped in horror and everyone's eyes went wide. Some of them looked away and flinched. There in front of them was the Fioridian belief that all Grisha needed to burn. There were three stakes driven into the ground with three bodies, one on each. Wyland didn't understand what was going on, and Nina explained to him angrily, this, this is what Fiordans do to Grisha. Mateus tried to stand up for his people. No, it's what criminals do. We've outlawed the illegal burning of, don't you dare, don't you dare. Tell me the last time someone was persecuted for lighting a Grisha on fire. Nina, but before the fight could escalate, one of the Grisha moaned. They were barely there. They were charred completely all around their body, but they were alive. What? Nina sobbed. She's a heart render. It would be the easiest for her to help this Grisha die with dignity. But she couldn't do it. And she begged someone. She was crying. Please, I can't do it. Someone just help. Everyone stood silent until Jesper stood up and shot the Grisha twice to put them out of their suffering. But Kaz was kind of pissed. Fuck Jesper, you just announced our presence for miles. Nina turned to Mateus, tears just streaming down snot. The reason no Grisha has ever found innocent after your trials is because our crime is just merely existing. Our crime is what we are. Nina, have you ever thought maybe, maybe you weren't supposed to exist? Nina scoffed. You're weak, and you know that. You worship ice spirits and wolves who can't be bothered or give you a rat's ass about you to even show up for you. But you see real power, you see real magic, and you want to kill it. Ravka is rebuilding. I hope they give you the fair trial that you deserve one day. I hope they put the Driskelia in shackles and make them stand to hear their crimes. And with that, Nina storms off. The Mateus she had known the first time that they were stranded, he was long gone. She reminisced about those long three weeks of them living off seaweed, going from camp to camp, trying to find signs of life. So this is like, I guess, during the war, maybe, or they were in a war-torn area. They were constantly using each other for warmth. He had asked how she got out of the cages when the ship was sinking and she said the water cup, the handle broke and it was jagged. All they had to do was not even cut through the bars, they just had to cut the ropes on their hands and free themselves. It was three weeks of them doing this until they finally told each other their names. I'm Mateus. Nina. That was a year ago and it felt like no time had passed. Mateus seemed to want to kill her still and all of her kind, so that's great. She could hear him tailing her in the snow trying to talk to her. She wasn't having it. And I guess that led to Mateus being butthurt because a whole lover quarrel starts in front of everyone. They're just trying to peacefully trek the snow now, but Mateus starts screaming, you know what, tell them, Nina. Tell them, why don't you? Tell them how great of a friend you really are. You guys are her friends, right? Well, tell them, Nina, that we traveled together for three weeks, I saved your life, we saved each other, and the minute that we get to the dock, the minute that we get around people, <laughs> You know what? You tell them, Nina. Tell your friends what you did. They should know how you treat your so-called friends. Nina turned around. Fine. I told the Kirch that he was a slaver and that he had taken me prisoner. I threw myself at their feet for mercy and begged them to help me. I had a seal that I had taken from a slaving ship that we raided and I used it as proof. Everyone looked shocked except for Kaz. Kaz already knew. Nina didn't try to tell them that after that she tried to recant her statement every second since. But there it was, the truth of what she did and why he still hated her so much. Nina started crying, but I had no choice. I had no choice. But tell me, if you had the chance to go back and undo everything, would you still do it the same? Yes, I would do it all over again. And before another fight could break out, the earth underneath them starts rumbling. An earthquake? But before they can process it, a giant slab of ice, like a giant piece of earth, shoots up in front of them, almost in a perfect square. And then the back of them, and then the right of them, and everyone is looking around, but Nina, Nina looks up. They were under attack. Whoever was doing this was trying to build walls using the earth mm. around them and trap them. Huh. She could see two Grishas flying around. These Grishas were not normal Grishas. Squallers can control wind and current. They're one of the lower ranks. She would see them tossing each other around in the air during playtime at school, but this is unthinkable. No squalor can do this, not even the best. This is another god? Unless they're on the Harem. Drug. Yeah, the drug. Wow, how are they just doing that? 
Jesper tried to shoot at the squalor, no luck. Nina tried to control the squalor's heart to drop them down, but they were out of range and moving too quickly. Soon enough, the squalor would have had them trapped and dead within minutes. Without exchanging a single word, Kaz drops down to his knee. He has one knee up like he's proposing. He cups his hand in front of him. Inej runs, jumps out, and uses his knee as like a launch pad and jumps up onto the walls. And he says, trust our wraith, guys, trust her. They did, but Wyland got to work anyway. He put down one of his little bombs and said, cover, and they all covered to the other side. Everyone down. And for a silence, nothing. And Jesper says, are you fucking kidding me? And then boom. So they were out now. And Wyland was so happy, so happy in fact, that um, he looked like he had no idea that it was actually gonna work. So that's not really reassuring. <laughs> he looked too happy that it, he was like, oh my God, that actually worked. <laughs> when they rushed out, they saw Inej standing over the body of a trembling little Grisha. One had a bullet wound in his thigh and the other one had a knife. Inej had thrown her knife and got him down. Mm. Now they're sad again. The Grisha grabbed at Nina's hands. I just need a little more. Nina didn't place him at first, but she knew this Grisha. Nestor. He wasn't even a squalor, it's a fabricator. They went to school together at the little palace. What do you need more of, Nestor? What's going on? Just give me a little bit of prep, please. Okay, Nestor, it's okay. I can heal your wound, just stay still. I don't want your help! Nestor, it's okay, please, just let me help you. He's freaking out trying to get away from her. Like, this guy is, just wants Param. He's a fabricator, but with that, he could do other yeah, magic. Yeah, like everything. Oh. He's freaking out, trying to get her away from him. He just wanted Parem, and he's screaming, Where are they? Where did they go? Who? The shoe! Tell them to come back, please! He got up one last time before he fell over again, and he never moved. But they were able to gather a few things from this. One, Nina's alliances were with her friends, yes, but she will always be a Grisha. She will always put them first, no matter what. And it's kind of scary to think about when you're considering, when you consider that they're trying to save a guy who has a drug that will destroy Grishas with their own powers. And two, the Shu were coming looking for Bayur, which means that they had even more competition. And they speculated that the Shu probably had a stash of Perem. They were drugging Grishas to bring them to Ice Court to help steal Bayur. I mean, that's what Kaz would do, right? Nina refused to leave without burying the Grisha. The others argued that it would take too long, but Mateus offered to stay behind and help her. He said he would make sure that they caught up with the rest of the group later. In what's supposed to be a romantic moment, they start digging in the ice and Nina opens up to Mateus. She tells him she was forced into accusing him of being a slaver. She said, when we got to the docks, I saw Grishas and they saw me and they saw that I was with you. I had to convince them that I was undercover. They wanted to take you prisoner to torture you, but I convinced them that you weren't alone and if you were captured right now, other Driskelli would come and save you. I promised to bring you to them the next day. Why didn't you just tell me? Because I didn't want you to kill them. That morning on the docks, I was trying to get us out of there as quick as possible, but I guess the Grisha were watching. They had seen us leave the lodge. They showed up on the docks and I knew they were coming for you. If they took you, you would be dragged to Ravka, interrogated and executed. So I spotted the Kirch trader and I accused you of slaving. At least that way we could get out of there. I begged them to save me so that I could be taken with you into custody. I didn't know that they were gonna throw you into Hellgate. I tried, I tried to recant my statement, but they weren't listening. So you left me to rot in Hellgate? Of course not. I could have gone home to Ravka. I wanted to, but I stayed in Ketterdam. I gave up my wages for bribes. I petitioned the court. So what are you going to do now? Betray the people you call friends again so you can save your people? They both glanced at each other. Neither of them wanted Bayur alive. They wanted him dead. And now, away from the others, they would make a pact. They would find Bayur first and kill him and make sure none of the others found out. That way, Mateus still got his pardon. So fast forward and the crew finally make it to town, somewhat in one piece. Thankfully, they don't stick out too much because there's a ton of for foreigners here for Equinox, but they wander till Kaz chooses what he deems the perfect bed and breakfast. They get a room there for the night. They opt to have dinner on the rooftop, and there is a reason why he chose this inn. It's a perfect view of the ice court. The food was inedible though, unfortunately. Kaz had a book that he wanted to pass around and he told them all to go to the last page, where instead of words, there's a small little cutout of binoculars. You open the book up and you look at it and it looks like you're reading. It looks like you're passing a book along with your friends, but you're actually using magnifying glasses to look at something in the distance. 
the ice court. They were stalking the schedule of the prison gates. Four guards, two checkpoints. It's exactly what they had suspected. When the prison van transporting new inmates, okay, it's more like a carriage, you know, because back in the day they didn't have vans, but when the prison van transporting new inmates was open to be evaluated at the checkpoints, they noted the prisoners were chained wearing hoods. That's how they were gonna get in. It wasn't a fun idea. Jesper said, but won't the guards realize that there are six more prisoners all of a sudden? Everyone sat around looking at Kaz. And Jesper said, oh no. Ah, we're bunk biscuits, aren't we? Everyone else was confused. Cass smirked and he explained. A tourist walking through our streets in the barrel keeps patting his wallet. Maybe it's in his back pocket, his coat pocket, but he pats it every so now and then, making sure it's there, congratulating himself that he's being extra cautious. Nobody's getting the better of him. But he's a fool. Every time he pats his back pocket, he's letting every thief on the block know where he keeps his valuables. A bad thief will snatch his wallet and make a run for it. But if you're smart, you grab the wallet and put something else in its place. So the fool will keep walking around, patting his back pocket, goofy grin on his face. And when he finally needs his wallet, you're long gone. And what do you know? His wallet is replaced by a rock, a bar of soap, sometimes a stale biscuit. A good thief knows the weight of things. They can see how heavy a wallet is just by the way it hangs in a coat. We're the bunk biscuits. That means they're gonna take prisoners out and put them in their place. Jasper looked at everyone and said, no mourners. And the rest sighed and said, no funerals. And the next morning, they get into positions. It was game day. This is the day they end up the richest of the dregs or they all end up dead, both with, it, with its own set of complications. They were all entering into the ice court without any of their weapons, completely unarmed now. Even Kaz had to leave his cane. Everything had to be left to their wits. Basically, that's it. It wasn't gonna be easy. The, they only had one shot. Their first job was to distract the prison truck drivers by throwing a tree down in their way. They would be so busy trying to get the tree off the road, the prison truck would be left unattended. I mean, of course, the prisoners were locked in there, first by the truck's lock, but also by their chains. Kaz would lockpick through all of that. He expertly worked his way through the prison truck lock, and when the door swung open, he stared. Everyone was hiding in the woods. What is he staring at? Why isn't he doing anything? We don't have time. Inej crept up behind him, and she looked into the truck. All the trucks that they had been spying on until this point, there were about maybe six prisoners in the truck. They were all seated and they were chained to their benches. This one was jam packed like sardines. <laughs> and they were chained to the roof and they all had hoods over their necks. They were standing. If one of them fell, it was gonna be bad. Inej gave Kaz a nudge. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? Claustrophobia is the least of their worries. But his face was pale. He looked like he was gonna throw up. The rest of the group slightly silently glanced at each other, having no idea what was wrong with Kaz right now. Slowly, Kaz got up and unlocked six sets of hands and foot shackles. He unloaded them one by one, and as quietly as possible, Nina was hiding behind in the woods, putting them to sleep. She was rendering them into a coma. When they would wake up, everyone would be long gone, and most of these prisoners, they're not gonna turn themselves in. They're gonna make a break for it anyway. They're technically doing these prisoners a favor. A few problems with this plan, other than the fact that they were willingly chaining themselves up amongst other prisoners, but they were also unarmed going into prison. They didn't have time to look at the passengers and pick which ones matched their descriptions the best. They mm -hmm. didn't have that type of luxury. Mm -hmm. So they're just gonna hope that the guards don't care. Mm -hmm. And another thing, Kaz was losing control. When he's locking the prison truck lock back, because he has to make sure it's chained up again, otherwise the guards are gonna suspect something. And Ash heard him multiple times scrambling to get the lock. He kept dropping his lock picking screws. They Wait, barely. What's going on? He's not doing well? Yes, yeah, something's shaking him up. Mm. All of the rest of them have hoods on their faces, so I don't know if they noticed. I don't know if they were too panicked to hear the screws dropping, but Inej noticed. They barely made it in time for the guards to move the tree, come back and tug at the door to make sure that it held up. Inej had a hood over her face. She was completely chained, but she stood next to Kaz trying to listen to his breathing. She knew it wasn't good. He was having a panic attack. It was because she was so careful with listening so closely, she knew exactly when Kaz, the deadliest of them all in Ketterdam, had fainted in the back of a prison truck. Things were already not going as planned, but let me take you a bit back, okay? Kaz Brecker doesn't have a lot of weaknesses, at least none that's publicly known, but he does hate being in cramped spaces. Not in the way that everybody does, like he has a real phobia of it. It's because that's how he almost died. After being scammed, Kaz and Jordy, his brother, they were going around looking for any sort of work. They wandered, eating whatever they could get their hands on, sleeping behind alleyways of taverns. They were angry, scared, hungry. And then one morning, 
Jordy woke up with a fever. Firepox. It was the biggest, deadliest outbreak in Ketterdam. Soon both of them would have it. They had no money for medicine, for doctor, for food, for shelter, nothing. They tried to push through, but so many have already died before them. Nothing made them special. For days, it was like they were in and out of a nightmare mixed between reality and, uh, and dreams of being back on the farm until Kaz woke up one day being rolled onto what they called a sick boat. Back then, when there's like deadly outbreaks, they quarantined the dead and the disease by rolling them onto sick boats, boating them out to like an island, and then burying them. Just in like a mass grave or lighting them on fire. So he's just around a bunch of sick corpses. They're stacked on top of him because technically these people are dead or practically dead, so nobody cares. So there's just dead people all around him, riddled with sickness and disease, bloated, some of them already decomposing. He was transported to the giant grave, but he was alive. He was the only one that was alive. Finally, he used all of his strength, grabbed Jordy, and headed into the waters to swim back to Ketterdam. He, he thought Jordy, Jordy was alive because he's alive, right? But he looked down and Jordy was getting bloated, but there was nothing he could do. He had to use his brother's bloated body as almost a flotation device. And ever since then, the feeling of being in a cramped space or even there's skin on skin contact, that's why he wears leather gloves because the feeling of Jordy's bloated skin on his hands as he was using him as a flotation device, he would never be able to get over that. He would never be able to get over that. When they floated back to shore, the feeling just, oh, Kaz was alive. But eventually the waves pulled Jordy back out to sea and Kaz wanted to die too. I mean, it's the only smart situation really, but he couldn't now. He owed it to Jordy. After what he did to Jordy and his body, he had to get revenge on Pekka Rollins. You're like, what? Why Pekka Rollins, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll go back there anyways. He was dreaming of this when Inej kicked him awake in the prison van and the only thing keeping him up and alert was her voice. He asked her to keep talking to him. We're, we're passing through the gates. We made it past the first two checkpoints. And soon the van halted to a stop. Kaz felt his chains being pulled off and he was dragged out of the carriage. His hood was taken off of him and he squinted to take in their surroundings. They were in a courtyard. The gates were being closed. The giant prison was now in front of them and the guards were standing high above pointing rifles down at the group. It was much more daunting in person. No matter how much they went over the plans in their heads, this was something else. When they were dragged inside, the Fjordans were those who liked to make a statement. The group looked up to see bodies hanging. They knew these people. They were from Ketterdam. They were Pekka Rollins' best. They had been caught and hanged for everyone to see. They were brought into, which means maybe Pekka Rollins was around. They were brought into a holding cell where guards were lining them up to go over paperwork. Which, side note, none of the paperwork worked. None of the six matched up with who the prisoners were supposed to be, like the genders, the ages, the ethnicities, nothing matched. Kaz knew this, but he was betting on what he bet with Big B. Laziness. The guards bringing in the prisoners would mumble about how it's not my job, my job is to transport prisoners in, I'm not a bookkeeper. The booking guards would argue it's not their job to make sure each prisoner was the right one when they were caught. They're not the ones out there catching them. They're not record keepers. So they all pushed responsibility around for the next group of guards. Yeah. One of the guards just yelled, just put them on East Block and have the next crew deal with it. From there, they were all led one by one to a woman standing at the door. Nina's heart pumped. She had put some wax on her arms and she hoped it was enough. The lady was a Grisha, a human amplifier. Basically, they can sense Grisha by touch. Oh. Most of the times they're hired to work at gambling dens or for high stakes card games to make sure that nobody has an unfair advantage. But here they were being used to make sure nobody breached their walls. No Grisha breached their walls. She held each hand and her eyelids shuddered briefly when she touched Nina. But in the end, she waved them all past. What? Did she know? Did she know? Or did she just not care? What? Or was Nina that good? We'll never know. In the prison, they were all escorted through a long hall made of glass and marble. It was clear it was the work of Grisha fabricators. Good ones. There's no way humans can make this type of place right now. I mean, that's the whole thing with Fjorda. They keep saying, oh, our place, you know, we believe in all these spirits and our old ancestors created ice courts. But anyone who knew, knew that Grisha slaves had created it. Mm. And they, they'd say all of this and they're like, Grisha, meanwhile, get out of the ice court then. 
Why am I angry? These aren't real. <laughs> this is fictional Stephanie. And the purpose of the beautiful glass hallway was clear. It's not to say, hey guys, we're rich. I mean, it is. But it's also so that each prisoner that passed before being processed could see the weapons, the armory, the tanks that were on display on the other side of the glass. It's said that these were the first tanks ever created that didn't need horses to draw them. Wyland explained, even the prison van was drawn by horses, but these tanks, it's unmatched in technology these days. You basically shoot giant cannons out of the end and the fire of that also fires the tank. You don't need horses anymore. Every prisoner walking in would be terrified to fuck with the Fjordans, which is exactly what these six came to do. None of it mattered to Kaz, though. He was more worried about the fact that the women were being led down the separate corridor to the women's side of the prison. He knew this was coming, but it still didn't feel any better. He worried for Inej, but he tried to stay sharp. This was going to be the hardest part. The male prisoners were led down the corridor into the stark white room. This one was equipped with hoses and tubs. The guard yelled at them and forced them to strip down. Now, knowing his background, I mean, this is his worst nightmare. He tried to keep Inez's voice in his mind, her sully wisdom, and she would say, the trick is not not getting knocked down, Kaz. The trick is getting back up. He thought it was useless sully wisdom, but he kept it in his mind. He looked up to see Jasper staring at his hands. What, what were you expecting? I don't know, claws at least. Kaz ignored him and waited for his turn with the guards. He remembered Inez, kept his head up, his guard yanked his head back with his hair and searched inside of his mouth. The guard's fingers ran over the back of his mouth where he stopped and ran over the spot again. And he screamed angrily and feared in while he aggressively yanked out two slender pieces of metal from Kaz's mouth. The lock picks. <gasps> the guard threw them on the ground and smacked Kaz on the head so hard he fell to his knees. Kaz got back up and saw Wyland's panicked face before he was thrown into an ice cold shower. He came out, slipped on his prison uniforms, and struggled to walk back into the cell with the rest of the prisoners. His leg was killing him without his cane. The prison cells were no longer marble and glass. They were very prison cell-y, colorless, gray, shoved to the brim with other prisoners, pooping in buckets. He walked in and heard the door yank close, the heavy noise of metal grinding on each other till the lock snapped into place. It was official. They were locked in a Friardin prison, the most inescapable prison in the highest security ice court. And how do you escape without picking the locks? How will they get out now? And that is part one <laughs> of Six of Crows. Oh my god, that was a good, good, what a is good that? little cliffhanger. Yeah. Damn. It's so good. Uh, okay, please go read Six of Crows, and I'm gonna probably start on the next one right now, and then potentially. Is there a part two coming? Yes, next Monday in exactly seven days. Okay. But if you can't wait, go read Six of Crows or read Shadow of Bone. Just check out all of Lee Bardugo's works because that's probably what I'm going to do next. Probably I'm going to read the next one and then maybe start Shadow of Bone. I don't know if I'm starting Shadow of Bone before I start the Netflix because I really want to watch the series. Let me know. If you guys have just read, no, if you guys have read both, if I have just read the Six of Crows duology, can I watch the Netflix or should I do Shadow of Bone first? Let me know in the comments. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's fam. It was so good. And I'll see you guys tomorrow and on Monday for part two. Bye.